What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're we didn't here. Clap. As- oh my God, the clap. I'm so sorry. Let's do it. <laughs> I didn't know if I should stop you, but I'm like, no, yep, you should. I, we- I knew I was forgetting something, and that's what it was. You see? Jagged energy. Okay, we'll start over. Yeah, here. I'll even. Yeah, I deleted that bit. But you oh. see, if you watch the video, this is the extra stuff you get, and you don't want to miss it. <laughs> Do you is? Come on. I love that you mentioned that. I was like, oh shit, I had not even, I would have cut it out, but now that I'm, I would have forgotten to cut it out. So yeah. Well, just a reminder. All right. Oh shit. Hold on. Sorry. Hold on. You'll love this. Something has fucked up. Oh my God. We may have to stop the recording. <laughs> this is the joke. I'm like, this is what you get. You get all the extras. But now for some reason, the my controls have all changed. This is a problem. Do you want to stop? <laughs> Let me see if this fixes it. If this fixes it, then we're good. We're good. Okay. All right. Okay. Here we go. I got to get. Wow. They're On really, three. They're really getting it tonight. All they right. are. Okay. One, two, three. Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? I, <laughs> I am I, a word that you and I used before we hit record, jagged. I, it's a jagged little pill. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep. I'm mentally in another place. Uh, this, oh God, this one has been a lot. And also like my youngest child is six and I, I know this won't make sense to a lot of people, but he is one child, but somehow encompasses the energy of all four children from overboard. (laughs) You know what I mean? Roy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Including the children or the specific child that's like doing funny voices. It's like, yep, that's, yep. This is. All of them in one. And I say it because we recently watched Overboard because I love it so much. But oh, it's such a classic. So good. Yeah. So good. Mm-hmm. And I'm always so proud of him for that closet he builds her at the beginning. I know. And then she turns her nose up at it. And I was like, but you never once said cedar. Everyone knows that a closet is made of cedar. Um, yeah, I could go on and on. I. I won't. Uh, yeah. You know, that's, that's a movie that is, I've recently been trying to think of things that I want to revisit when I've had some times where, because if I'm working, like I like to have a movie on, I don't, I, this is so weird about how my brain works. I can't work with music on at all. I can't do it. I don't know why it just, but a movie, like the sound of voices that I can, that I can do. So I'm constantly trying to think of like what things to rewatch that I also don't need to pay attention to. Cause that's not helpful either. Uh, Cause then I want to pay attention. Um, I need stuff, but overboard is a good one. I should put that in the rotation of stuff to put on while I'm like working, writing and stuff like that. Recently, I thought to myself, maybe I should rewatch blue Valentine. And here's the thing. No, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. There's never a reason. Never oh. a reason. Fabulous movie. Amazing performances. Don't need to ever view it again. Oh, I was told uh, by a friend once that before I ever watch it, make sure that I am the happiest I could ever possibly be in my life. And I don't know what it says about me that I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> But the point is, I think that kind of scared me where I was like, oh, that's gonna, I, you know, the, where it's going when someone's like, mm-hmm. make sure that you could not possibly be happier. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think that, um, I think that the whole kind of POV of that movie is that even if you are the happiest you've ever been, you can always fall. <laughs> God. Yeah, again, beautiful performances. Ryan Gosling, Michelle Williams, just two of my absolute favorite actors. And uh, yeah, I should never watch it. And this happens usually once every couple of years. I get the itch where it's like, and sometimes I cave. Twice I've caved. I think I've seen the movie three times and I have to stop. It's just, you can't, you can't. It's gutting. It's gutting. It's gutting. So then what I did recently, 
uh, I had this itch today. And so what do I put on? La La Land. And let me tell you a little something. For the first, you know, 95%, sure. And then it's that last 10 minutes that's just like having yeah. your insides ripped out of your asshole. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that was, yeah. you know, again, at least it was a shorter amount of emotional trauma that I was deliberately letting myself have than a full film of trauma, you know? Yeah. If you, 10, like five, 10% is better than a hundred. Hey, in this world, in that respect. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, listen, I got to ask you real quick, what you drinking over there? Oh, I, I, I didn't want a chance booze coming into this. So yeah. I've got a water as always. Uh, and then I just a quick trip to 7-Eleven, <laughs> of course, because I, I just, I want, I want that. I want that Coke. Well, actually, I guess technically it's a Pepsi one, but I want those little ice crystals. Slurp, it slurp, puts slurp me, it up, slurp, 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 slurp it up. I don't know what's happening right now, but I like it a lot. I jagged little pill yeah it's yeah. <laughs> both of us are we're, we're really bringing it we're bringing it hard um yeah well i like that i like that for you yeah i needed something because this i started researching this one early yeah because you did the research last week and so right. that was the week i didn't have to but i was like i'm gonna start it now and thank god i did because yeah. there is so much to get through. And I know yeah. I didn't get through all of it, but I did the best I could. And oh Lord, I'm ready to get out. Like it's, I've been in it. It's the most pages I've had maybe ever yeah. on this show, uh, especially within the last, like, I was going to say within the last year, we've barely been out more than that. <laughs> It feels like we've been out for 80 years. Yeah. Uh, but this is, yeah. I mean, I have not looked to see if this is the most, but it might be. It's the most I've done in the last six months easy. Which is nice for me because again, I, you know, I tend to be a little verbose and uh, then I feel less embarrassed when I, you know, when you really bring a heavy one. So look, look, we're not going to, we're going to jump into it is the point because, um, uh, you did you have said this is a lot this is the most you've ever had and so it's a we're, lot. we're gonna have to get into it but before we do i just want everyone to know dry january is over <laughs> and i couldn't be happier uh it was my birthday last uh friday i, I don't know when this is uh, my birthday was february 4th whenever this is airing it, you just do you do your own math anyway the point is um so I'm back on the saddle and let me tell yeah. you something. I've got my old standard LaMarca in hand. Nice. I will say I, I had a, a dinner uh, planned with a group of friends and we, I planned it at this, uh, I rented like a private patio type situation, beautiful, you know, catered. Elvino did flow. Of course. And uh, I got back to my house. I was a little intoxicated. And I sat on the back of, of my couch and then apparently I just went over and did a full backward somersault, um, narrowly managing to miss crushing peaches. So what I like is that even when I am in danger, potentially, you know, could have broken my neck. I like that my, my maternal instinct still kicks in and I, I dodged her. I dodged her. Of course, it's like if you two were driving in the car. <laughs> And uh, you saw something and had to hit the brakes. You'd stick your arm out across the seat that of she's course. in of to course. make sure she's safe. It's the go-to mom move. It is the go-to move. Uh, but listen, all of that being said, we're going to dive right in. We're talking, of course, about Nicole Brown Simpson in this episode. Now, this is a our January patrons poll pick. Uh, we're over on Patreon, patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails. And one of the benefits uh, you get when you subscribe is you can vote in a monthly poll to choose one of the episodes that we cover right here on the show. And this was uh, the winner for January. Um, and so, yeah, there is, I'm sure a lot. I mean, again, I I'm seeing your research list here and my goodness. Yeah, there is a lot to, <laughs> there's a lot to, to kind of wade through because this is such a prolific case, obviously, um, that has been addressed so many times. So we'll dive yeah. right in. Yeah. And uh, see how we do. Fingers crossed. I know. And in advance, I know, I know there's going to be stuff that I don't bring up, but there is so much 
that it's I, I fit in everything that I possibly could. It's to the point I have to make edits on the fly. And I don't like that because I get anxious about it. Sure. Uh, sure. So I, it's it's not going to be a, a, a clean edit, but we'll see. I'll just, I'll do the best that I can. And we're just in for a real, real ride. <laughs> it's what we're in for. Listen, it's going to be great. I can't wait. Let's get into it. If you haven't heard of the case or you'd like a refresher, I'm going to give it to you now. In June 1994, police were called to the home of 35-year-old Nicole Brown Simpson. Inside the house, police found candles burning, music playing, and Nicole's children asleep upstairs. But outside the house, police discovered a brutal crime scene and the bodies of Nicole and 25-year-old Ron Goldman. Because of blood evidence and footprints at the, found at the gruesome scene, police arrested Nicole's ex-husband, actor, and former NFL star, O.J. Simpson. What followed was a media circus that completely captivated the world. So what really happened to Ron and Nicole? And with an overwhelming amount of evidence, how did the prosecution possibly lose? Christy Oxborough investigates. I'm happy that that finally made it to the synopsis <laughs> that you wrote. That makes me very happy. I, the way it was going, I was like, you know what? There's only one way I can sign that off. Absolutely. It's, again, just it's uh, it's a lot of things. And I know that there are going to be comments about you left some things out, but then you put in stuff that's like ridiculous and not relevant. And it's like, well, welcome to my head. This is what it's like inside my brain. This is. And when works. you curate, when you that's your prerogative. <laughs> and and we just all hope for the best. Uh, as I have been lately, I am going to start this off with a disclaimer. This episode will contain mentions of domestic violence and attempted suicide, as well as graphic descriptions of a brutal murder scene. Trigger warning for those who need it. Now, Lewis Brown, a.k.a. Lou, and Juditha Bauer met while Lou was working as a correspondent for the American Armed Forces publication Stars and Stripes. They married around 1956 and had their first daughter, Denise, in July 1957. While the family lived in Frankfurt, West Germany, they welcomed Nicole on May 19, 1959. The Browns eventually moved to Garden Grove, California, where they welcomed Dominique around 1965 and Tanya around 1969. In her senior year at Dana, Dana Hills High School, Nicole Brown was named homecoming princess before her graduation on May 20th, 1977 at the age of 18. She worked at a clothing store for two weeks before landing a job as a waitress at The Daisy, an upscale restaurant and club in Beverly Hills. The Daisy side note. It was said to be the first members-only disco in Beverly Hills and was the spot for celebrities. In 1965, it was the place where Aaron Spelling met his future wife, Candy. Huh. And it is said that it is one of the first places where Frank Sinatra went public with Mia Farrow. With an elite clientele, the Daisy often named various menu items after celebrities. I've seen two different versions of menus. And if you saw the list of foods and the list of celebrity names, I guarantee no one would successfully match the name to the dish. Some are interesting. I don't have time to get into all of them, but just to give you an idea, a Warren Beatty was a grilled cheese sandwich, a Frank Sinatra was a roast beef sandwich. Charles Bronson, tuna salad. Huh. Jane Fonda, fresh fruit with jack and cheddar cheese. And Sylvester Stallone, fresh squeezed orange juice. <laughs> just the juice, huh? Just, just the juice. Just the juice. juice. Uh, over the years, some of the menu items got renamed to other celebrities. I don't know when, but at some point, a Paul Newman which is scrambled eggs with a sliced orange, let's let that sit, uh, became known as an O.J. Simpson. And I wasn't even alive at this point, and yet I'm livid because I adore Paul Newman. <laughs> I just, I love that man so much. Yeah. Uh, a quiche Lorraine, which was originally named for Warren Mass, became known as a Cicely Tyson. And the last one I'm going to mention because I have to move on, but I had to mention this. 
on the newer menu, a corned beef on rye, a Gary Busey. <laughs> Utah, give me two. Yeah, I just, I want so badly to be able to have that opportunity to walk in somewhere and be like, oh, you know what? I'll start with Jane Fonda. And then I think I'm going to do Warren Beatty with a side of Sylvester, you know, like that. That's wild like that. to me. And I would like that very much. Uh, the Daisy can be seen in the movie American Gigolo and the miniseries Hollywood Wives. Uh, it was during the very, her very first shift at the Daisy that 18-year-old Nicole Brown would meet 29-year-old Orenthal James Simpson. At the time, Simpson was a famous football player, although Nicole had no idea who he was. And despite the fact that Simpson was legally married, he and Nicole started a relationship almost immediately. Simpson was so taken with Nicole to the point where the couple moved in together a few months later. Nicole also dropped out of Saddleback College, where she had just enrolled a few months prior. According to their divorce filings years later, Nicole said she dropped out of college because Simpson, quote, required she be with him. Mm. That is foreshadowing. Mm. Simpson got divorced in 1979, and he and Nicole were engaged in 1983 and married February 2nd, 1985, at their home known as Rockingham. They welcomed a daughter, Sydney, in October 1985 and a son, Justin, in August 1988. On the outside, the Simpsons appeared to be the idyllic family, but hidden underneath it were years of physical and emotional abuse and philandering. And it was Simpsons' repeated extramarital affairs that caused Nicole to file for divorce in 1992. Now, don't worry, I am not going to gloss over their relationship entirely. I will get into more details later. Trust my process. Yeah. So just before midnight on June 12th, 1994, a couple who had been out walking saw an Akita dog acting agitated. When they got closer, the couple noticed the dog appeared to have blood on its paws. When they followed the dog, they saw a blonde woman lying on the ground covered in blood. They called 911 and police were sent to 875 South Bundy Drive in Brentwood. The first officer to arrive on scene was Robert Risk, who had only been on the job for about five years. Inside, Risk noted that there was a cup of half-melted ice cream on the banister, and the TV was on. Inside the master bathroom, the bathtub was full, and the room was lit with candles. Outside, the scene looked like a horror movie. Risk noted two bodies, one male, one female, both lying on the sidewalk near the open front door. The bodies appeared to have sustained multiple stab wounds and were covered in blood. Other things of note found at the crime scene include a left-hand leather glove and a blue knit cap, both believed to have been worn by the assailant, an envelope that contained eyeglasses, bloody footprints made by the assailant, and blood drops allegedly from a wound on the assailant. And once again, don't worry, I will get into more specifics later on. The female victim was 35-year-old Nicole Brown Simpson. Her two children were found asleep in their rooms upstairs. So just remember that if the dog hadn't been spotted by neighbors, it is likely the children would have discovered the crime scene when they woke up in the morning. Nicole was a devoted mother who had recently become interested in starting her own interior decorating business or potentially looking into photography. She was described as bubbly and the sweetest, most decent person you could meet. Friends say they saw Nicole as the moral compass of their group. Also found at the scene was the body of 25-year-old Ron Goldman. Ronald Lyle Goldman was born July 2nd, 1968, near Chicago, Illinois. After his parents' divorce six years later, Ron and his younger sister Kim would live with their father, Frederick. In 1987, the family moved to California, where Ron worked as a camp counselor, a tennis instructor, and a waiter. He also had a brief stint as a model. In 1992, he appeared on the Fox dating show Studs. Oh, hey. Prior to his death, Ron earned an emergency medical technician license, but his dream was to open a bar or restaurant, so he never pursued it. He was very athletic and into surfing, tennis, rollerblading, and beach volleyball. 
Ron was described as good with people and very loving. His sister Kim said, quote, people are just drawn to him. Ron and Nicole were adamant that their relationship was strictly platonic and none of their friends or family members believed they were dating. Now, with such a brutal murder scene that clearly depicted a lot of rage, police looked to the closest to the victim. Which brings me to a quick recent stats to back me up side note. (laughs) I am a believer that in a crime, police will look first at those closest to the victim, as statistics show that the assailants tend to be someone that the victim is familiar with. That, of course, isn't always the case. But in October of 2020, the Victim Policy Center released a report about the stats of female victims being murdered by someone that they know. According to the report, in 2018, 192 women were killed by men in the state of California. And of those cases, 88% of the victim knew the killer prior to the incident. And of that 88%, 68% were the victim's intimate partner. And I know some are going to say, okay, Christy, but that's just California. And you're right. But I couldn't quickly find stats for the entire country, but what I did find were stats for Canada. According to the Canadian Centre for Justice Statistics, in 2015, 76% of all solved homicides involving female victims were committed by a family member or spouse. 6.1% were committed by a stranger. So again, it's not like it never happens, it just isn't as often. Now, of the 76% member family member, 48% were committed by a spouse or intimate partner. So it should come as no surprise that the first person the police looked at was Nicole's ex-husband. Oh, here we go. (laughs) Orenthal James Simpson was born July 9th, 1947 in San Francisco, California. Most people tend to call him OJ. And while I previously was referring to him as Simpson, from here on out, I'm just going to call him OJ for the sake of simplicity. OJ's parents, Jimmy Lee Simpson and Eunice Durden, had two kids prior to OJ, uh, a daughter, Shirley, and a son, Melvin. After OJ, Jimmy and Eunice welcomed daughter Carmelita in 1948. For unknown reasons, Jimmy abandoned his family in 1951, and Eunice was left to raise their four children on her own. She worked nights as an orderly and became a technician in the psychiatric ward of San Francisco General Hospital. Eunice would later be a hospital administrator. While at Galileo High School in San Francisco, OJ started playing football. First as a tackle, then as a fullback, he was fast, big, powerful, dynamic, and a superior athlete. In 1965, OJ enrolled in junior college to attain a scholastic record that would get him into a bigger college. In 1966, San Jose State tried to recruit him, but OJ was picked up by the largest and oldest university in Southern California, USC. OJ was a force to be reckoned with on the field, especially during a game between the USC Trojans and their rivals, the UCLA Bruins, on November 18, 1967. Late in the fourth quarter, the Bruins were winning 20-14, to but OJ got the ball and managed to make a 64-yard run to win the Trojans the game. That run is still regarded as one of the greatest plays in college football history. Artist Arnold Freiberg even immortalized the moment in a painting titled O.J. Runs for Daylight. USC would later retire O.J.'s jersey, number 32. During the civil rights movement in the late 1960s, sociologist Harry Edwards said that they tried to get Black athletes to take political stands and become a force within the movement. Edwards said, quote, we were trying to get Black athletes to understand they have a role in the current civil rights movement. Edwards said that he asked OJ, as he was a world record holding track star at USC at the time, but OJ responded, and I quote, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Yeah, pretty, the prolific yeah. quote of, of OJ's, yeah. Yeah, and when I hear it, I hear it as Jay-Z. Oh, sure. Y- you know that, so it, it's, it comes out, a li- it hits a little different. Um, Edwards did go on to inspire track stars John Carlos and Tommy Smith to give the Black Power salute during a medal ceremony at the 1968 Olympics in Mexico. 
One month later in December, OJ was awarded the Heisman Trophy, which goes to the most outstanding player in college football. And again, this is going to seem pointless, but this is what happens in my brain. Heisman, side note. The Heisman Trophy was created in 1935 to recognize the most valuable college football player east of the Mississippi. The first recipient was Jay Berwanger, a halfback at the University of Chicago. When club athletic director John Heisman died in October 1936, the award was renamed in his honor and eligibility was broadened to include all college football players, not just in the East. Some notable Heisman winners include Bo Jackson in 1985, Barry Sanders in 1988, Tim Tebow in 2007, Cam Newton in 2010, and Matt Leinart in 2004. And if you're not a sports person, but the name Matt Leinart still rings a bell to you, it's probably because he was in the 2008 film The House Bunny. And no, Lauren was not in that movie. That's a fun callback to a recent Patreon episode. So there you go. There you once go. I learned once I learned that, I was like, oh well, I I have to That's go down. Amazing. I have oh to go down God. this for the bit. Of course. Uh OJ went first in the 1969 AFL draft and he joined the Buffalo Bills. The first few years in Buffalo were rocky because the coach tried to make OJ a receiver, but he couldn't catch the ball. And as the name of the position implies, being able to receive the ball is the whole job description. But when the coach was replaced by another coach who was a big believer in running the ball, OJ was moved to the position of running back where he would shine. In 1973, he became the first player to rush more than 2,000 yards in a single season. During his time playing pro football, OJ was nicknamed the Juice, which to be honest, I had never once questioned, and yet somehow during research, that's when I learned because it's a play on orange juice, like OJ. And I went, oh, I hadn't ever considered that. And I said something, I was, I think I was speaking to my husband and our 10-year-old was there and I said something about OJ and I said, they call him the juice. And our 10-year-old went, oh, like orange juice. And I was like, (laughs) fuck. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, yeah, to be honest, I just didn't give a shit to think about it. If I cared about him, I might have been like, why do they call him that? I didn't care. That's fair. That's where we're at. Jag it. Uh, in the mid 1970s, the company Hertz did a survey asking customers what they cared the most about when it came to rental car companies. The number one answer was speed of service. So an ad agency came up with the idea of OJ running through an airport to get to Hertz. Because at the time, OJ was known for incredible speed. The ad was not only a hit, but also groundbreaking. At the time, celebrity endorsements from athletes weren't really a thing. And beyond that, OJ was the first national black spokesperson for Chevrolet. Because of knee injuries, the Bills traded OJ to the San Francisco 49ers in 1978. He retired after one season. He was, of course, uh, the big deal throughout his career, winning numerous awards that I'm not even going to bother to mention. In his professional career, OJ achieved 11,236 total rushing yards gained, which at the time of his retirement placed him at second in the all-time rankings. I don't know where he sits now, but I've seen a list of the top 20 players, and based on those numbers, he's probably like 21st or 22nd now. As of October 2021, the number one spot is Emmett Smith with over 18,000 yards. Oh, wow. Uh, OJ was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1985. After his playing career ended, OJ stuck around the stadium, becoming a commentator for Monday Night Football on NBC. This quickly transitioned into acting, and soon OJ was on episodes of shows like Dragnet 1967, Ironside, and In the Heat of the Night. He also appeared on five seasons of the comedy First and Ten about a fictional professional football team. OJ hosted an episode of Saturday Night Live in 1978. Uh, TV work soon transitioned into movies, and OJ got parts in The Towering Inferno, Capricorn One, and all three of the Naked Gun series. Shout out to the memory of Canadian treasure Leslie Nielsen. 
Fun fact, he was born in Regina, Saskatchewan, which is less than an hour from where I currently live. And just because I can't stop myself, Mr. Nielsen had an incredible career, which, according to IMDb, included 255 credits. And because I love synchronicity and lists, I'm going to list the shows that Leslie Nielsen has been a part of that we have mentioned previously on this show. Because that makes sense to me. <laughs> of course. Of course it does. MASH. Uh-huh. Columbo. Oh. The Littlest Hobo. Oh. Murder, She Wrote. Hey, Highway to Heaven, oh, the Golden Girls, and Who's the Boss? And if this is actually the first time I've ever mentioned Who's the Boss, then let me say the answer is Mona. Shout out to my personal favorites of Leslie Nielsen's credits, Do South and Men with Brooms, which both happen to star Canadian heartthrob Paul Gross. And that has been your minute of Canadian content. Back to the show. We do need a, we do need some sort of a, a sting. I was, was going to, that's a better word for it. I was going to say like a track. Oh, like I'm in a studio. Uh, maybe we should have, maybe our sting should be something done by sting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a rose. Maybe that's what we play. It. <laughs> Cause he's the, oh, da, oh, da, da, da. Yeah, that, yeah. that's him, right? Yeah. I know he was in the police. I know, I know he had other stuff, but Roxanne, no stop. You don't have to turn on the red jagged little pill. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I can't. Yep. Our album just keeps writing itself. It does. Uh, so now we have basic background on OJ Simpson. Before we get into his relationship with Nicole, though, I want to look at his relationship with his first wife. When OJ transferred to USC in 1967, he brought with him his wife of five months, Marguerite Whitley. OJ and Marguerite dated in his senior year of high school. She had originally been dating OJ's friend, Al Cowlings, uh, but OJ convinced her that she should date him instead. They were engaged three months later. OJ and Marguerite were married June 24th, 1967, and would go on to have a daughter, Arnell, in December 1968, a son, Jason, in April 1970, and a daughter, Erin, in September 1977. Now, we're going to bring it down a moment uh, for a quick tragic moment before we move on with OJ's timeline, and trigger warning because it deals with a very small child. Oh, dear. In August 1979, Erin fell into the family swimming pool. Uh, she was found unresponsive and taken to a nearby hospital where she fell into a coma. Eight days later, she died of respiratory failure. She was just days away from turning two years old. OJ said that his daughter's death was the catalyst that led to the end of his first marriage. Mm. Which is an interesting thing to say, since OJ and his wife had already been legally divorced by that point. Okay. Not to mention he'd been in a relationship with Nicole Brown for the past two years. Uh, later, O.J. blamed the end of his marriage on uh, his fame, saying, quote, the price of fame was our biggest problem. My wife is a private person, yet we can't walk down the street without causing a commotion. And dude, sometimes marriages end. It's a normal part of life. But to blame the death of your child or your fame is bullshit. You had been cheating on your wife for years. She was tired of it, period. As I stated earlier, uh, during Nicole's very first shift as a waitress at the Daisy, she met OJ, who took one look at Nicole and said, I'm going to marry that girl. And this was in June 1977, when OJ's wife was about six months pregnant. Oh, boy. Personal opinion hidden as a side note. <laughs> I don't believe that OJ was said he was going to marry Nicole that day. I honestly think he uses that story to help with the narrative that they were this beautiful love story right from the beginning. He's told so many versions of their first meeting, including a time he stopped in on his own on his way out of town, saw her for the first time. And then once he claimed that she was the waitress when he took his wife there for their anniversary. Either way, to openly hit on someone while you're married and your wife is pregnant and it's your anniversary, there's too many layers. Juice, it's time to stop. Juice. <laughs> I love I. Love that I felt the need to call him Juice in the moment. It felt it right. It felt right. Oh, it's not cute. 
I see, I just, I, I see, I can see why he would try and build the narrative that way. But again, just my opinion, hidden as a side note. Of course. Uh, Regardless as to how it first started, Nicole and OJ began an affair while his wife was pregnant. But sadly, his affair with Nicole wasn't OJ's first infidelity, and it certainly wouldn't be his last. He has openly admitted to cheating on both of his wives numerous times. When he was married to Nicole, OJ had an affair with model Tawny Katane, who you may recall from White Snake's Here I Go Again video. (laughs) I don't know why I she's jagged little pill. Yeah, exactly. Uh, According to friends, his reason for the affair was because Nicole had gained weight during one of her pregnancies. Uh, It's it's, again, (laughs) it's one of those things where like you try to come in and and not be biased, but boy, oh boy. Oh, it's, it's sometimes he makes it hard. He makes it hard. It's uh, it's, it's difficult. So friends described OJ as an incorrigible womanizer. He openly cheated on her multiple times, something he admits to. But when asked in a 2006 interview, he downplayed it all by claiming, yeah, he had affairs, but so did Nicole. The only relationships of Nicole's that I could confirm were ones she had while her and OJ were separated. But since I'm not personally involved with anyone in the case, I can't say for certain. It just feels like someone's trying to make his own cheating not seem like a big deal. And since the person he's claiming cheating is no longer able to uh, stand up for herself, then, uh, yeah, he can say whatever he wants to say and people will believe it. I don't. But that's, that's, again, hidden as a side note. Of course. During that same interview, OJ also downplayed the domestic violence in their relationship, saying, quote, I don't know why the media made such a big deal about these things. What things was he referring to? Let's take a look. In 1985, police officer Mark Furman arrived at the Rockingham estate. He said it was his first time there, but that numerous officers had been there before. When Furman arrived, he noted OJ was holding a baseball bat and Nicole was sitting on the front of a Mercedes 450 SL. The windshield smashed in. Nicole, hysterically crying, OJ appeared to be in a rage. It took three attempts to ask him to put the bat down before he would comply. Officers asked Nicole if she wanted to file a report. She declined. Later, OJ would describe this incident saying they were just sitting outside on the hood of the car and he was just gently bouncing the bat against the tire and Nicole said, oh, be careful or he'd have to pay for it. And he hit the windshield and said, what or do I have to pay for that? I pay for everything anyway. (sighs) Again, downplaying things is a classic OJ move, which you'll see coming up time and time again. Some reports claim that Nicole was inside the car at the time the windshield was broken. Mm -hmm. According to Nicole's diary, which came up at the trial, which we will get into, I promise. The first time OJ ever laid a hand on Nicole was in 1978 after a party. Trigger warning for domestic abuse. She said he threw her to the floor and kicked her. The diary entries also include an incident in 1986 where he, quote, beat me up so bad at home, tore my blue sweater and blue slacks completely off me, went to a hospital on Wilshire, claimed it to be a bicycle accident. OJ had to talk to the doctor about a possible skull fracture. Oh, my God. According to Nicole, OJ allegedly told her how to dress, how to wear her hair, everything. He followed her when she went out without him or had his friends follow her. He was even known for planting spies in her friend group who would keep him updated on her whereabouts. Nicole told her mother that OJ would follow her around and hide in her bushes. She said, quote, I'm scared. I go to the gas station. He's there. I'm driving. He's behind me. OJ was also allegedly known for locking Nicole in closets when they would go to hotels. Nicole once told a friend, quote, Don't ever be left alone with him. You don't know what he's capable of. Nicole's sister, Denise, has openly talked about OJ's anger, saying that his eyes glaze over and he becomes a different person entirely. Another domestic incident between OJ and Nicole, and probably one of the most well-known, is from New Year's Eve, 
1989. Technically, it was New Year's Eve 1988, but police came at like three in the morning. So then it became 1989. You get what I'm saying. Yes. Now, from OJ's account of the evening, so far, I've found at least two versions that he's given about the night. In a 2006 interview, OJ claimed Nicole mistakenly believed that their friend Catherine uh, had that. Sorry, uh, OJ claimed th- that Nicole had been told by her friend Catherine that OJ had bought Nicole fancy earrings. So when Nicole didn't receive any earrings, she believed OJ bought them for someone else and that meant he was cheating on her. He claims Nicole flew into a rage and started hitting him. So he just had to defend himself and shove her. OJ claims Nicole was very confrontational and physical and that she was known for getting into fights whenever she would go to a club. Nicole's friends say she was the exact opposite of all of that. So OJ claims they get into this physical altercation and he locked her out of the room. Next thing he knew, the police showed up. Now the first responders version of the events of that night, trigger warning, uh, a call came in to 911 between 3 and 4 a.m. on New Year's Eve. When the dispatcher answered the call, no one responded. In the background, a woman is heard screaming, oh my God. The dispatcher later said she could hear someone being beaten in the background. So she sent police to the Rockingham address of the the, uh, Simpsons estate. When police arrived, uh, they pulled up to the gate and Nicole came running out of the bushes in nothing but a bra and sweatpants. She screamed, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. According to the officers on scene, Nicole's face was swollen and scratched. She said she wanted OJ arrested because the officers had been there eight times before and had done nothing. OJ walks up, starts screaming, quote, I don't want her in my bed anymore. I've got two other women. According to the police report on the incident, quote, they were involved in a verbal domestic dispute in the bedroom. The dispute turned physical when suspect became angry. Victim stated suspect punched her on the forehead and slapped her numerous times. This caused bruising and soreness to the victim's face. Three Polaroids taken. The officer also referenced cuts on Nicole's nose and cheek and a handprint on her neck. An officer told OJ that he was under arrest. So OJ said, okay, he's just going to go into the house and he's going to change. So, he, you know, because it was the middle of the night, he was barely dressed. Uh, but instead, he got in his Bentley and took off out the second driveway. The next day, OJ called a cop buddy of his to say that Nicole got aggressive with him and physically attacked him. So would he be in trouble from running from the cops? And the friend was like, no, no, it sounds like you were in the right here. Then Nicole arrived at the police station with Polaroids showing multiple incidents of battery. The friend later said that prior to that, he had no idea that OJ was physically abusive towards Nicole. Yeah, spoiler alert. People don't tend to know. Yeah. And uh, what I will give props to this friend is at that moment, he was like, oh, okay, no, yeah, there's a problem, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, OJ was charged with spousal battery. He pleaded no contest. He was sentenced to 120 hours of community service which is enraging to say the least. But what makes the sentence worse is the fact that his community service was him golfing and organizing a celebrity golf tournament. I can't. Yep. Oh, there's going to be a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, The sad fact is that if the previous incidents of abuse had been, had involved charges of any kind, the New Year's Eve incident would have been considered a felony. I would like to be clear, I'm in no way blaming Nicole for not pressing charges. The only person I blame in this scenario is OJ, especially when I hear the way he talks about it. He went on an ESPN talk show called Sports Look in 1992 and said, quote, when I look at it, it wasn't really that big of a fight because it was New Year's Eve and 3 a.m. and we just finished a big party and it got a little (laughs) loud. Yeah, he laughed at the idea of their fight getting loud. He also said, quote, the day after this was over, we looked at it, say we had a big fight. We were both guilty. 
No one was hurt, was no big deal, and we got on with our life. No one got hurt. How do you explain the Polaroids of your wife? OJ also said, quote, most of the time she was a loving wife and a perfect mother, but it seemed like lately any little thing could set her off. To be honest, it worried me. Which is really just OJ trying to portray himself as the victim. And I find that so gross that I might seethe by the time this is over. Yeah. In a later interview, OJ says, quote, I got physical. I was wrong. But somehow I came out of that night as the poster boy of abusers, followed by, quote, when I look back on my life, other than the deaths of my loved ones, along with Nicole and my daughter and my mom, I always said it was the most depressing and sad night of my life. But okay. you, you've already said it was no big deal. Uh, but <sighs> psychologist hat, maybe mm-hmm. that night bothered him so much because it hurt his reputation. The thing he seemed to care the most about in the world was what people thought of him. And after that night, he was branded as abusive and he couldn't stand it. But I'm, of course, speculating about how OJ must have felt. As for the abuse, there are Polaroids and police reports that back that up. When news got out about the attack, Nicole personally called the CEO of Hertz, since OJ was their spokesperson at the time, and said they'd had a fight, they overreacted. She told her friends she wanted out, but that she was going to stay for the kids. OJ called a friend and said, quote, you have to help me save this marriage. I told her I'd never do it again. A few years later, OJ and Nicole would separate, but the domestic incidents didn't stop, even after Nicole moved out. In April 1992, at the Roxbury Club in L.A., Nicole was on a date with her new boyfriend, Keith Zlomsiewicz. OJ showed up at the club, although if you ask him, he wasn't stalking her. He just happened to be at the club. In a 2006 interview, OJ says he obviously wasn't stalking Nicole because he was at the club with like 16 people. And quote, you don't bring a big big group with you if you're going to stalk someone. So so he's an expert in stalking. mm, Well, so OJ just ran into Nicole that night. Uh, (laughs) And then in this same interview uh, where he's saying, I didn't stalk her, just ran into her. He then says later that same night, he decided he was going to stop by her place to, you know, quote, maybe get some. And when he arrived at her house, he saw movement in the window. So he hit the door twice and left. OJ claims he didn't know the full details about what was happening in the house until after he talked to Nicole. And yet Keith said that OJ confronted them the next day saying, quote, I watched you last night. I can't believe you would do that in the house. I watched you. I saw everything you did, which is so gross. But as OJ stood there screaming at Keith and Nicole, Nicole asked to speak with him privately. So they left Keith in another room. Keith said he could hear OJ freaking out and just screaming at her. And minutes later, they both came out of the room. OJ stuck his hand out to Keith and said, no hard feelings, right? I'm a very proud man. Now, a few quick things about this specific incident. One, OJ talks about it as absolutely not stalking, then goes on to describe exactly how he outright stalked her. It wasn't stalking. We just happened to run into each other. And then after she left, I went to her house uninvited. And two, he specifically said he hit the door twice and left. He didn't knock. He hit it, which is a completely different vibe. And why hit the door at all? Because you're upset that the wife you're separated from is in a relationship with someone else. And three, you see your estranged wife out with another man. And when she leaves, your first thought is, I'm going to see if she's up for a booty call. This man's ego is so incredibly frustrating. Although if you ask me, he said it was a booty call because it was the only plausible excuse that he could think of to come up with an explanation that would prove why he was in the area when he wasn't supposed to be Mm -hmm. without outright saying, oh yeah, I stalked her. 
I was like, I didn't yeah. stalk her. I was just trying to get laid. It's like, you saw her with her boyfriend. Okay. Keith also mentioned a time when they were at a club and OJ walked up to their table, looked Keith in the eye and said, quote, I'm OJ Simpson and she's still my wife. Oh my God. Shockingly, Cole, Nicole and Keith only lasted about a month. Yeah. So, I which I've seen interviews with him. He seems lovely and it's so sad that he took that from her, but yeah. OJ, not Keith. Yes. So OJ and Nicole attempted to reconcile a few times, but on October 15th, 1992, they officially divorced. Months later, they tried to reconcile again. According to Nicole's diary entries, she said, quote, I want to put our family back together. I want our kids to grow up with their parents. But the reconciliation didn't last. On October 23rd, 1993, just seven months before her death, Nicole calls 911 and says, quote, my ex-husband broke into my house, ranting and raving, and now he's just walked out on the front yard. The operator asked if the husband has been drinking, and Nicole said, quote, no, but he's crazy. OJ can be heard in the background screaming obscenities at Nicole. Then just two days later, on October 25th, Nicole calls 911 again. She asked for someone to come to her home at 325 Gretna Green, saying, quote, he's back. When the dispatcher asks to describe the he in this scenario, Nicole responds, quote, he's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. O.J. can once again be heard screaming obscenities at Nicole, telling her that Keith is a loser. Keith, being the man that the Nicole dated for a month, 18 months prior to oh this moment. Oh, my God. And just for reference, again, they only dated maybe a month. Yet, to clarify, OJ showed up at Nicole's house unannounced and uninvited, kicked the door in, and started screaming about a man that Nicole hadn't dated in well over a year. In that same time frame, OJ had been dating a woman named Paula Barbieri off and on. Nicole tries to tell him that the kids are sleeping upstairs, so he needs to be quiet. She tells the 911 dispatcher, quote, he's fucking going nuts. He's going to beat the shit out of me. On the second recording, you can hear him break down the door. He was completely terrorizing Nicole. But if you ask OJ, he was just looking out for his kids. By going to the house where the kids were sleeping and yelling at their mother over rumors he'd heard. Someone had allegedly told OJ that Nicole was running with a party type crowd and that she'd gotten into drugs. I could not find a single thing to corroborate that. On May 22nd, 1994, less than a month before her death, Nicole told friends she was officially done with OJ and she finally felt free. He had given her a, a diamond bracelet for her birthday just days prior, but Nicole gave it back saying, quote, I told him I can't be bought. OJ later joked with police, it wasn't a big deal. He just turned around and gave the bracelet to his girlfriend, Paula, and acted like it was a brand new gift for her. Oh, Which I, I hope Paula knows. I assume Paula's not in his life anymore. Good I God. would assume, yeah. I need to believe that. Paula, you deserve better. Uh, friends say that uh, OJ started to spiral after Nicole was free. He was convinced that Nicole had had affair, an affair with his friend Marcus Allen. OJ even claims Nicole admitted to the affair, although Marcus has been adamant that it never happened. But OJ told Nicole if he ever saw if she ever saw Marcus again, he would kill her. You see, another thing I learned about OJ during my research was he has an, an intense jealousy streak. And Marcus Allen was considered to be a young OJ. Marcus was bigger, stronger, hotter, younger. And he was able to play professionally for 15 years, which is longer than OJ. He even broke OJ's all-time rushing yards record. So the idea that his wife would sleep with the man who seems to intimidate OJ, yeah, I could see that making him angry. But again, we have no proof whether of the course. affair happened or not. On June 10th, Nicole went property hunting in Malibu, which was a huge step for her. Since the separation, she had lived within a couple miles of OJ's estate. So I think it was great she was finally branching out. 
But that brings us to the events of June 12th, 1994. OJ and Nicole's daughter, Sydney, had a dance recital at Paul Revere Middle School at 5 p.m. OJ said he'd been in New York and thought about staying there, but he'd missed a recent event for his daughter already, so he was adamant that he would attend this one. He was exhausted and had had a long week, but he flew from New York to L.A. earlier that day, knowing he had a red-eye flight to Chicago later that night. When asked about the recital, OJ says that Nicole saved him a seat so that he could sit with the family, and that Nicole was dressed like a teenager, quote, in the shortest, tightest thing. I don't believe that's what we asked about the recital, Didn't OJ. ask about it. OJ claims a mutual friend of his and Nicole's, whose daughter uh, was best friends with Sydney, took OJ aside and said Nicole's hanging around with some bad people, and she was partying and doing drugs again with this. But I found, once again, no evidence of intense drug use. I can't say whether or not she did any at all, but it didn't seem to be that she was this frequent user that anyone that OJ was trying to say that she was. After the recital, Nicole, her parents, her sisters, and her children headed for dinner at a nearby restaurant called Meza Luna. At one point, OJ claimed he was invited but opted not to go. But in later interviews, he claimed he asked if he could tag along and was told no. I'm not sure why he has conflicting stories about that. Uh, OJ said that while the rest of the group headed to dinner, he went home as he was tired and irritable. Sometime after 9 p.m., OJ tried to call his on-again, off-again girlfriend, Paula Barbieri, but there was no answer. At 9.10 p.m., he drove his Bentley to McDonald's, taking his house guest, Cato Kalin, with him. They arrived back at Rockingham at 9.36 p.m. Cato went to the guest house and made a long-distance call at 9.37 p.m. And just to clarify, Cato remained on the call until 10.52 p.m. And the friend who was on the other end of the call did testify to that in court. I'm only bringing that up now to prevent someone from getting too deep into the what if it was Cato theory, you know? Yes. Uh, OJ tried calling Paula again at 10.03 p.m., but there was still no answer. OJ claims he then packed for a red-eye flight that he'd had later that night, went outside and started chipping golf balls into his neighbor's yard. He said he usually, it usually helped clear his mind, but for some reason, he couldn't stop thinking about Nicole. And that is the last official known whereabouts of OJ until 10.54 p.m. Just to clarify, OJ's whereabouts between 9.36 and 10.54 p.m. are unknown. At 10.25 p.m., Alan Park, the limo driver hired to take OJ to the airport, arrived at the house. Since he was 20 minutes early, Alan got out of the car and had a cigarette. At 10.40 p.m., he pulled up at the gate, buzzed the gate multiple times. No one answered. He tried the buzzer again at 10.49 and 10.52. Alan then contacted his boss to say there was no one home. Moments later, Alan sees a person approximately six feet tall, 200 pounds, African-American in all dark clothing, walking along the driveway. Alan waited a minute, pressed the buzzer again. This time, OJ answers, saying he'd overslept. He'd be down shortly. Five or six minutes later, OJ came out of the house with a Gucci bag and a garment bag. After making two or three trips back and forth to the house, OJ got in the limo and they left Rockingham at 11.15 p.m., headed for LAX, which is roughly 14 miles or 22.5 kilometers away. They arrived at the airport at 11.35 p.m. and OJ's flight, American wow. Airlines Flight 668, departs from Chicago at 11.45 p.m. As for Nicole, she had dinner with her family at 6.30 p.m. at Mezzaluna in Brentwood. Around 8 p.m., Nicole and her children left the restaurant and headed home stopping for ice cream along the way. Around 9.37 p.m., Nicole's mother, Juditha, called Mezzaluna looking for her missing glasses. Someone at the restaurant says Ron Goldman, a waiter whose shift was just ending, could drop the glasses off on his way home. The glasses were put into an envelope and Ron was seen leaving the restaurant around 9.48, 9.50 p.m. And just to clarify, 
Ron and Nicole knew each other enough that they had gone for coffee a few times prior, but again, strictly platonic. Some of Nicole's neighbors claimed to have heard Nicole's dog barking around 10, 15 p.m. Other neighbors out walking just after midnight noticed the dog wandering around. When they got closer, they noticed the dog had blood on its paws, and that's how they discovered Nicole. As a refresher, when officers arrived on scene, the front door was open. Nicole was lying on the sidewalk in front of the door, wearing a black dress covered in blood. On the left, there was a man leaning over on his side, also covered in blood. There were bloody footprints, blood drops nearby, with a trail leading down the sidewalk. Police believe the suspect was wounded on the left side. Found near Nicole's body was a bloody left-hand glove and a blue knit cap, which Canadians would call a toque. Inside the house, there were candles lit and music playing. Now, we're going to get graphic for a moment. So trigger warning for those who need it. According to the autopsy reports, Nicole was hit on the top of her head with the butt of a knife. The coroner then believes that Nicole was stabbed four times in the neck while she laid on the ground. Then Ron arrived ran towards her and grabbed the killer who stabbed Ron five times in the face before slitting his throat. Ron was somehow able to get loose and ran, but got blocked by a perimeter fence. The killer catches up to Ron, stabs him in the side, severing Ron's abdominal artery. Defensive wounds on Ron's hands show he was trying to protect himself. The coroner believes that the killer then went back to Nicole, lifted her head by her hair, and sliced her throat. God. To the point of near decapitation. The the photos are... Yep. Uh, The photo... It's pretty pretty horrific. Um, The killer then went back to Ron and stabbed him again, although the coroner believes that Ron was likely already dead when that happened. When officers checked the house and found Sydney and Justin sleeping upstairs, they knew they had to notify next of kin, which in this case was OJ. But getting OJ's number took some time, so around 4.30 a.m., officers headed to OJ's house. They buzzed at the gate to get in. No one answered. They walked the perimeter and found OJ's white Ford Bronco, which had a small bit of blood on the driver's side door. And since the blood droplets at the scene led police to believe the killer had been cut during the attack, officers felt this gave them probable cause to enter the property. An officer jumped the fence and opened the gate. They banged on the door and still no answer. They went to the guest house on the property and knocked and Cato Kalen answered the door. Now, I barely even know who Cato is as a person, but what I found is he was born Brian Gerard Kalen in 1959 and was given the nickname Cato after the character from The Green Hornet. Cato was an aspiring actor with a few bit parts in movies like Beach Fever, Prototype, and Cyborg 3, The Recycler. In the winter of 1992, Cato was on a ski holiday in Aspen, Colorado, where he met Nicole Brown Simpson. Somehow that led to Cato staying in Nicole's guest house when she lived on Gretna Green. But then Nicole moved to the condo on South Bundy. Cato went to live in OJ's guest house. In court, Cato testified the reason he moved with OJ instead of uh, with Nicole is because OJ and Cato felt it wouldn't be appropriate for, quote, a good looking bachelor to live under the same roof as Nicole and the kids. Oh, wow. boy. Wow. Uh, so, in short, Cato was just trying to be an actor and was using a famous couple to try and increase his connections in Hollywood. And the only reason people still bring him up is because of shows like Celebrity Big Brother. According to officers, When they first spoke to Cato, Cato asked if there had been an earthquake, because earlier in the evening, around 10.50 p.m., he heard loud banging outside. It was so forceful that the pictures on the wall moved. So Officer Mark Furman went outside and walked the perimeter of the guest house, where he found a blood-soaked glove on the sidewalk near the back of the house. 
the glove appeared to be a match to the glove that was found at the scene of the crime. They finally find a phone number for OJ at the O'Hare Plaza Hotel in Chicago and called him around 4.25 a.m. with the news. OJ allegedly checked in at 4.15 a.m. And according to the hotel manager, OJ received at least one phone call and made about 10 outgoing calls before immediately checking out. At 10.45 a.m. the next morning, police execute a search warrant at OJ's estate, which gives them access to his house and his Bronco. In the house, they find a pair of socks in OJ's master bedroom that have drops of blood on them. They also find more traces of blood inside the Bronco, including a bloody shoe print on the driver's side floorboard. At 12 p.m., OJ arrived at Rockingham, where he is taken to the police station for questioning. And I'm not going to say the interviewing officers did a poor job. I'm not a cop. Obviously, I am not trained in the art of police interviews. But honestly, they didn't ask any follow-up questions, which felt lacking. And for most of it, OJ just brags about stuff, like how he's got 100 pairs of Bugle Boy jeans and he got them for free, and how his favorite brand is Reebok. They didn't ask. Oh, God. He also sang part of the Hertz jingle and reminisced about how people love talking to him about that ad he used to be in. How is any of this relevant? It's not. But the interviewers just let OJ talk. And when it came to pushing him about the issue at hand, you know, the murders, they just never pushed OJ when he gave a half-assed answer. And remember how I said, based on the blood droplets at the scene, the police believed the suspect had been injured on the left side during the attack. Well, OJ, being interviewed by the police, showed up with a cut on his left hand. During the interview, he was asked how it happened. And he told them "Ah, it was sometime after the recital. Later on, OJ would say when he was notified of Nicole's death, he broke a glass out of anger. The investigators just didn't press it any further. Allegedly, the hotel in Chicago confirmed that a broken there was a broken glass and a bloody towel found in OJ's room after he left, but I could not find multiple sources on that. But it's just, I find it wild. What are the odds that he would also happen to have a cut, like that, that cut would happen on the left? Uh, But OJ's response to the cut on his finger always changed. First, he said, I don't remember. Maybe I was in a rush to catch my flight. Then he said, I broke a glass. I went bonkers. Then, quote, or actually, maybe I reopened a previous cut. He also changed the story with his friends, telling some he cut it on a glass. He told others he cut it chipping golf balls. He told another he cut it getting his cell phone out of the Bronco before the flight. But even if they found broken glass in his room, I'd still like to know how the blood got on the outside of the Bronco before he left for Chicago and allegedly cut his hand. But somehow that is not one of the questions that was asked. And the investigators just took his answers at face value and never pressed further. Then they quickly switched gears and asked OJ if he ever hit Nicole. He said, They had a fight one night, referring to the New Year's Eve fight. Then he said, quote, that night we had a fight. Hey, she hit me, you know. And as I say, they never took my statement. They never wanted to hear my side. Nicole was drunk. She did her thing. She started tearing up my house, you know, and I didn't punch her or anything. I wrestled her is all I did. Time and time again, this man continues to bring up the New Year's Eve arrest, but always puts the blame on Nicole. It's enraging, almost as enraging as the fact that they didn't even seem to press the fact that at the time of the murders, O.J. Simpson didn't have an alibi. Yeah, I know. Oh, boy. Yeah, I I can't. I mean, I can't. Oh, God, I love that I, I was like, should I stop there for a quick break? And then I was like, I got five more minutes. <laughs> Barrel through, baby. We got we got this. Uh, on June 17th, prosecutors ordered OJ to surrender, and he agreed. So the police had a press conference set for 11 a.m. to announce that OJ had surrendered. 
But at 11, OJ didn't come in. So they waited. Three hours went by, still nothing. At 3 p.m., the Los Angeles County District Attorney and the LAPD Commissioner held a press conference to announce OJ was now officially a fugitive. At 5 p.m., Robert Kardashian, a lawyer and OJ's friend, read a letter to the media allegedly written by OJ. The following is a small portion of it. Quote, to whom it may concern, first, everyone understand, I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. Don't feel sorry for me. I've had a great life, great friends. Please think of the real OJ and not this lost person. Thanks for making my life special. I hope I helped yours. Another quote from the letter is, quote, if we had a problem, it's because I loved her so much. Oh, don't, don't do yeah. that. And yeah, don't do that. To clarify for those who may not know, Robert Kardashian is the father of Courtney Kim Chloe and Rob Kardashian. Robert was married to Kris Jenner from 1978 until their divorce in 1991. Fun fact, OJ was Robert's best man at that wedding. Kris then married Caitlyn Jenner that same year, and they had Kendall and Kylie. Kendall's middle name is Nicole in honor of Nicole Brown Simpson. And that is my extent of knowledge on the Kardashians. And I'd prefer it to stay that way. Uh, although if I'm going to talk about them, I have to follow that with a quick topical side note. This message is specifically for Lamar Odom. Lamar, you treated Chloe badly. She doesn't want you back. Stop running to the press any press that will listen, telling them how much you miss her and you dream about her. Stop you in using Chloe's name to try and keep yourself relevant, you piece of shit. So OJ uh, <laughs> said he would surrender and his friend Al Cowlings picked him up to drive OJ to the sheriff's office. However, they never arrived. So that means OJ's a fugitive. OJ was last seen at the Kardashian house around 12 p.m. Around 5.51, OJ calls 911 to say he has a gun to his head and, quote, I'm just going to leave. I want to go with Nicole. That's all I want to do. That's all I've been trying to do. Police are somehow able to trace OJ's location, and the white Ford Bronco is found on the 5 freeway in Santa Ana. This led to the now infamous white Bronco police chase. And it wasn't what you expect when you think police chase. It was done at a very low speed, 14 police cars all hanging back. But of course, they're hanging back after hearing the letter read by Robert Kardashian. The police were trying to be very cautious as the note led police to believe that OJ might be suicidal. Al Cowlings then called 911 to say, quote, this is AC. I have OJ in the car. He's still alive, but he has a gun to his head. He just wants to see his mother. Let me get him to his house. At one point, LAPD detective Tom Lang was able to get through to OJ's cell phone and OJ said he wanted to be clear he wasn't running. He told Al that he wanted to go to Nicole's house, but when they showed up, there were too many cops. So he said, take me to Nicole's gravesite. And then it was, nope, just take me home. Other quotes uh, during this specific phone call from OJ, quote, all I did was love Nicole. All I did was love her. Nope. Quote, I've already said goodbye to my kids. Quote, I'm the only one who deserves this. During the chase, Al Cowlings, who was OJ's childhood friend and former teammate, drove the vehicle while OJ was seated in the back, cradling two framed photographs and holding a gun. Network television saw an audience of 95 million Americans. At the time, there were 263 million living in the United States. It was the highlight on sports coverage that day, which is a shame because it was also the same day that legendary golfer Arnold Palmer played his last round at the U.S. Open and the day that Ken Griffey Jr. tied Babe Ruth for the most home run hits. But that news got mostly ignored for the sake of that chase. So hashtag justice for Arnold and Ken. And because June 17, 1994 was apparently a big day for sports, it was also game five of the NBA Finals and the day the New York Rangers won the Stanley Cup. According to CNN, Domino's Pizza reported record sales that night as people were so glued to their TVs, they weren't interested in making supper. Their sales rivaled that of Super Bowl Sunday. And for those in the area who are interested in the specifics, the 60-mile chase started on the five 
before heading down the 91 and then the 405. The Bronco arrived at OJ's Rockingham Estate at 7.57 p.m., and while Cowlings got out of the car immediately, OJ refused to move. The SWAT team spoke with OJ, and he officially surrendered at 8.47 p.m. Some believe that he purposely waited until it was too dark to surrender, as there were news cameras everywhere, including helicopters circling overhead. In my personal opinion, not that anyone asked for it, but I think OJ went through the whole Bronco chase to try and gain public sympathy before his inevitable trial. But what do I know? Al Cowlings was arrested for aiding a fugitive, but the charges were later dropped. Numerous sources claim there were $9,000, a disguise, and OJ's passport in the Bronco at the time of the chase. OJ, of course, denies this. Wowzer. Uh, listen, so much happening. I just want to address my coughing fit that happened partway through there. Just choking on my own saliva. That's where we're at. Jake, a little, uh, listen, so much to get through so much more to get through. I am riveted. This is a case that I thought I knew inside out and backwards. And guess what? As always, Christy brings the goods that even I didn't know. So we're going to take a quick break. Now we're going to come on back and we're going to keep on discussing the very tragic murder of Nicole Brown Simpson on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. During the break, I went to my fridge and got, what do you, what do you guess? What do you bet? It's a Palm Bay rainbow twist. That's right. Uh, nice. Christy brought me some uh, when we met up in Vegas and now I reap the benefits. Um, but that can't take away from the fact that we're talking about two of the most grisly murders we've talked about on the show in some time. So, Christy, what's next? Uh, I would like to state it for the record that I did hear your coughing fit and my instinct was stop and make sure she's OK. But business, Christy, went finish. We can edit that out. <laughs> I love that you just pressed ahead. It was just my own spit. I mean, that's just so embarrassing. But yes, no, I like that you were just like, I keep going. The show must go on. Well, I was like, I don't know. Do I stop and ask? And I was like, I don't know what, uh, you know. So I do know. I do. Uh, we are going to come back into this right away with a white Bronco side note. Hello. Now, most people believe that the white Bronco involved in the police chase was OJ's Bronco, which had been found with a blood spot on it on the door just days before. The Bronco involved in the chase was actually owned by the driver, Al Cowlings. OJ's Bronco was seized as evidence for the trial, which I will get to shortly. Uh, not long after the chase, Cowlings told a friend he needed to sell the Bronco ASAP because he never wanted to see the vehicle again. The first buyer offered Cowlings $75,000 for the car if he would also include 250 autograph photos of himself driving it. And that's an incredible price when the car was only estimated to be worth about $1,800 at the time. But when Cowlings found out the buyer intended to use the car in an OJ style true crime tour, complete with driving in the Bronco on the same route as the police chase, and then ending at Nicole's grave, Cowlings backed out of the deal. The man sued Cowlings and they settled out of court for an undisclosed amount. In the end, OJ's former agent, Mike Gilbert, Al Cowlings, attorney, and a third man pooled their money and bought the Bronco for $75,000. I don't know why that was the asking price. Uh, it then sat in an underground parking garage for years. Allegedly, it rarely moved. So in 17 years, it put on about 20 miles. <laughs> so money well spent, I guess. I don't know. Uh, then it went on display at the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. The owner went on Pawn Stars in 2017 to sell the Bronco for $1.3 million. And shockingly, no one took the deal. And the car currently resides at the Alcatraz East Crime Museum in Pigeon Ford, Tennessee. And wow. just one more thing before I move on, because this is fucking wild to me. And I had never heard this before. Here's a holy shit. What are the odds? Side note. After the Bronco chase, OJ ended up in the same Los Angeles County men's jail in the cell next to Eric Menendez. 
For those who may not know, Eric and his brother Lyle were in jail for the 1989 murder of their parents. Apparently, the Menendez brothers were at the county jail as they were awaiting a retrial. Lyle said he had more than 100 conversations with OJ as they waited for meetings with their counsel in the jail's attorney room. But the relationship between OJ and the Menendez brothers actually started years before. Oh. Eric and Lyle's father, Jose, was the CEO of Hertz in 1973. And by 1979, he was the company's worldwide manager. So Jose was the one who helped sign the endorsement deal between OJ and the rental company back in the 70s. And at one point, OJ even stayed at their house, where he would often play catch in the backyard with the boys. And OJ Simpson playing catch with the Menendez brothers is absolutely not something that I had on my true crime bingo card. I will tell you that much. Wow. That's a weird synchronicity. It's wow. Crazy to me, but, uh, and if that isn't weird enough, it turns out it was Eric Menendez who connected OJ with Johnny Cochran. But (laughs) if I'm going to start talking lawyers, I need to get into what is known as the trial of the century. Now, just to clarify, there is a lot about the trial. I could probably do multiple full-length episodes just covering the trial alone, but I'm going to try and give you the Cliff's Notes version of events for the sake of time and interest because it gets dull a lot. But I wanted to point out for the sake of fairness while researching this case, among other research that I did, I made sure to read a book written by one of the prosecutors and one written by someone from the defense. Look at you. I was trying to be, I'm going to say diplomatic, but that's not the word I was looking for. Impartial? There it is. Yep. Completely different word. Yep. So first, a brief overview of the key players from the trial. Judge Lance Ito, who made a lot of choices in the trial that I did not agree with. Uh, But I'm not a professional. I'm just a sleuth. Uh, The prosecution, lead prosecutor Marsha Clark, Christopher Darden, and L.A. County District Attorney Gil Garcetti and William Hodgman. O.J.'s dream team. There were a lot of lawyers on this defense counsel, like Carl E. Douglas, Peter Neufeld, Barry Sheck, Gerald Ullman, and Alan Dershowitz. But the main ones to remember are civil rights attorney Johnny Cochran. Hollywood fixer Robert Shapiro, OJ's BFF Robert Kardashian, and old man Winter F. Lee Bailey. (laughs) Of course. Everybody got a name, and I was like, what do I call him? That seems right. Uh, Fun fact, F. Lee Bailey once represented Patty Hearst. Hey. And I know I've thrown a lot of names at you, but don't worry. This is an overview. I will most likely not say many of those names again tonight. <laughs> so you're safe. You're safe. I'll probably only really say two, no, three of them because, uh, Darden, what the fuck were you thinking? We'll get there. July 22nd, 1994, at a pl- preliminary hearing, OJ pleads not guilty. And on September 9th, the prosecution decides not to pursue the death penalty, opting instead for life without parole if convicted. The jury was selected November 3rd, 1994, and on January 11th, 1995, 12 men and 12 women were sequestered. Yes, they sequestered the jury plus some alternates, and apparently during the the trial, 10 jurors were replaced by alternates. Oh, yeah. On January 24th, 1995, Christopher Darden gave the prosecution's opening statement saying, quote, he killed her out of jealousy. He killed her because he couldn't have her. The next day, Johnny Cochran gave the defense's opening statement, which was, quote, this is a case about a rush to judgment, an obsession to win at any cost. So you get an idea as to the direction that both sides are trying to go to prove their case. February 12, 1995, the jury was taken to visit key locations in the crime, such as the Bundy crime scene and O.J.'s Rockingham estate. 
According to Marsha Clark, this visit was originally her idea. She said it can help to take the jury out of the courtroom setting and place them at the actual scene to give them perspective and bring the focus back to the victims. However, if you're going to visit the crime scene, it should be done at the same time of day as the crime so the jury can see things the way the victims did. However, for some reason, they went to the scene in the middle of the day. And the judge only agreed to the visit if it was fair for the defense, which meant that the jury would also be taken to OJ's house. Now, the only areas of significance would be the area where the glove was found, the viewpoint from the limo driver's perspective, and maybe where Cato was staying to see it in relation to where the noise came from. Otherwise, touring the house is useless. The prosecution argued the relevance, but for some reason, Judge Ito let the tour happen, including the jury being taken through OJ's trophy room. To quote Marsha Clark, quote, this is a sympathy play on their part. That's all it is. There's no evidentiary value to it. And to her point, one of the jurors, Michael Knox, showed up to the tour in a San Francisco 49ers hat and jacket, which feels interesting when touring the trophy room of a man who once played for the team. Knox believed that his outfit choice got him replaced as a juror. In reality, it was when Judge Ito learned that Knox failed to divulge the fact that Knox had once been arrested for kidnapping his girlfriend. Oh, my the, God. The charges were dropped, but Knox didn't mention that on his juror questionnaire. But the issue about the jury touring the Rockingham House is that the defense counsel went and change the house to better suit the persona that they were trying to portray in court. There are police photos of Rockingham at the June 13th a search warrant. And on a wall along the staircase, there is a series of photos. There are photos of OJ with Nicole, OJ with a bunch of famous white people, rich people, actors, politicians, stuff like that. But when the jury toured the house, all of those photos were replaced with photos of OJ with a series of black friends and family and children and all of that. And at the top of the stairs, the defense hung the Norman Rockwell lithograph called The Problem We All Live With, uh, which depicts six-year-old Ruby Bridges being escorted by U.S. Marshals on her first day to an all-white school. Where did the defense get that picture? from Johnny Cochran's office. Yes. And while I don't agree with Judge Ito on that ruling, he finally did something that I did agree with, and that is allow the jury to hear evidence of OJ's alleged domestic abuse towards Nicole. The prosecution then mentioned the years of physical abuse that Nicole had to endure. The police used a search warrant to gain access to Nicole's safe deposit box. Inside was a handwritten will dated September 30th, 1990, along with numerous Polaroids that documented years of abuse. OJ, of course, denies any wrongdoing and says any allegations of abuse, quote, existed only in Nicole's mind. Oh, I can't. That. Yep. I oh, can't. I know. It's, yep. Uh, with no witnesses to the actual crime, the prosecution relied heavily on DNA evidence, which in 1995 was still relatively new. 61 drops of blood and a total of 108 exhibits of DNA evidence were presented during the trial. All of the samples were validated and cross-referenced at three separate labs using different tests and no discrepancies were found. The defense was offered the chance to do their own testing of evidence samples, but they declined. The defense argued that the evidence gathering phase was mishandled and the evidence had been compromised. But three, three separate labs. It's yeah, fine. it's fine. Uh, the judge also allowed microbiologist Dr. John Gerds uh, to testify about contamination in previous LAPD cases, even though they weren't applicable to this case in any way. But neither of the defense's forensic DNA experts supported the defense's theory of cross-contamination or being compromised. The defense then argued OJ's preserved DNA was transferred onto all but three exhibits. And the three exhibits that they weren't transferred onto were then corrupted by dirty cops planting evidence. 
which is wild since the defense had zero proof that evidence planting ever occurred. Judge Ito allowed that the defense to argue it anyway. So the defense decided to hide the mountain of evidence by focusing on what they believed to be the corrupt police officers who were involved in the case. By the end of the trial, the only piece of evidence that Johnny Cochran focused on was the single bloody glove found at OJ's house. Field criminalist Dennis Fung found traces of blood in the drains in the master bathroom sink and shower. Unfortunately, Fung didn't test all of the sinks in the house, just the sinks that appeared to have been used recently, so it could be argued that the positive came from rust or vegetable matter. Ay, ay, ay. And throughout the trial, Fung proved that he made repeated errors in the investigation. He missed a blood stain on the rear gate at the Bundy crime scene, even after an officer instructed him to log it. He missed samples in the Bronco, which had to be re-examined at the request of the defense, I might add, uh, which showed multiple samples that Fung had previously overlooked. One of the samples was Ron Goldman's. So the only way they found out that Ron's blood was found in the Bronco was thanks to the defense. Oh, my God. But since Fung missed it on his first sweep of the vehicle, the defense then argued, well, he missed it because it was planted after. But when crime scene photos are checked, the photos from the first sweep on June 14th and the second sweep on September 1st show a blood droplet on the dashboard in the exact same place. And that specific spot was the sample that proved to belong to Ron Goldman. So it was there the whole time, but Fung somehow missed it. And since DNA tests take so long to do, the prosecution went weeks without being able to enter this into evidence. Not that it seemed to matter, but the defense just continued to push the idea that every piece of evidence had been planted. Now we're going to end up running into a time issue. So let's just look at key evidence that was found in the case. Blood belonging to Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman was found in OJ's Bronco, as well as on the bloody glove that was found at Rockingham Estate. The blood droplets at the crime scene, as well as on the back gate, believed to be the suspects, were found to be O.J. Simpson. Defense argued that the blood was planted by corrupt police, and yet there are crime scene photos that prove the existence of the blood drops before investigators were ever given a blood sample from O.J. So if they planted it, how did they get it? Neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the blood found on a pair of socks that were worn or that were found in OJ's bedroom at Rockingham was a match to Nicole Brown Simpson. The bloody footprint at the scene matched the bloody footprint found in OJ's Bronco. It was determined to be a size 12 Bruno Mag Mag Magley Lorenzo model shoe. It was only sold at 40 locations and only 299 pairs were sold at the time. The defense claimed OJ never owned them and you can't prove it. Check everywhere. Those shoes don't exist because he never owned them. OJ's hair was found in a blue knit cap that was found at the scene, as well as on Ron Goldman's shirt. However, one of the cops at the crime scene took a blanket from inside the house and used it to cover Nicole, which is incredibly respectful. However, it led to the defense arguing that OJ's hair was transferred from the blanket to the knit cap and Ron's shirt, even though the officer said the blanket was never near the cap or Ron. But there is no way to prove or disprove the idea of transfer because after the bodies were taken away, the police disposed of the blanket. So it couldn't ever be tested uh, to prove if it had OJ's hair on it or not. Right. The final piece of evidence that I'm going to bring up are the gloves. Oh, yeah. The gloves were cashmere lined Eris brand gloves in a size extra large. They were exclusive to Bloomingdale's and less than 200 pairs were sold. A receipt was found for identical gloves, which Nicole Brown Simpson purchased in December, 1990. The left glove was found at the Bundy house and the right glove was found by Mark Furman at OJ's house. Both gloves had blood and hair from the victims. 
Now, Detective Mark Furman took the stand to talk about finding the second bloody glove. The defense, of course, tried to claim that the glove means nothing because Furman is a racist who planted the evidence. The defense asked Furman if he'd ever used the N-word at any point in the last decade. Furman said no. Enter the Mark Furman tapes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Furman sat down with reporter-turned-screenwriter Laura McKinney to help her with some background while she was researching for a script about the LAPD. McKinney had 13 hours worth of taped interviews with Mark Furman between February 1985 and July 1994. On the tapes, Furman described partaking in police brutality towards Black suspects. He made racist slurs and remarks, including using the N-word. And since Furman had testified that he did not use the N-word, and then there was proof that he did, he basically perjured himself and had to pay a $200 fine and go on probation until April 1998. Uh, That conviction has since been expunged from his record. Oh, interesting. And if all of this isn't gross enough, on the tapes, Furman also admitted to being part of MA, M-A-W, or Men Against Women, a group of L.A. police officers who, quote, engaged in sexual harassment, intimidation, discrimination, and criminal activity against female LAPD officers, often endangering their lives. Furman bragged about being a leader of the group, which in the mid-80s had 145 members in the 18 police divisions of Los Angeles. Some quotes, Furman said, just because they enraged me. Yep. Quote, you've got to be able to shoot people, beat people beyond recognition, and go home and hug your little kids. Women don't pack those qualities. So much is wrong with that statement. I can't. So many layers yeah. From, yeah. From, from the first to yeah. the end, top yep. to bottom. Yeah. Uh, another quote, uh, females lack the one ingredient that makes them an effective leader, and that is testosterone, the aggressive hormone. Oh. And just for all the Mark Furmans in the world, just know that research shows that female officers are more skilled than male officers when it comes to de-escalating a potentially violent situation. My point being, never underestimate a woman's ability to lead. Thank you. Portions of these tapes were admitted into evidence during the trial, and just like that, Detective Furman's credibility was shot. Quick aside, the LAPD investigated Furman's claims, and of the 29 incidents of police brutality that Furman referenced on the tapes, only 12 were found to be linked to actual events. And even then, it seemed Furman, thankfully, wildly exaggerated the events. For example, at one point, he said uh, that a suspect had been beaten to death and three others were hospitalized with broken bones. Well, according to the investigation, only one suspect was treated for minor injuries in that specific incident, and the injuries were caused by another officer. So interesting. uh, But also because of this job, I'm super skeptical of the LAPD being in charge of the investigation into the LAPD. Also a good point. But we don't have time to go down that rabbit hole. (laughs) But... There was uh, an internal affairs investigation that found the LAPD had been regularly covering up incidents of family violence caused by their own officers and giving Mm. officers who were caught physically abusing their spouses only minor suspensions. And the officers in question were regularly exonerated. But again, we don't have time today. I know. It's so layered. There's just so many... Things that, I mean, again, this this could be ten hours long. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing too, right? Like, it's all terrible. No matter how yep. you slice it, it's all terrible. All of it. Yeah, all of it. And there's, it doesn't matter what case we do, it starts small. Yep. And the rabbit hole just it gets, always does gets darker. So maybe Furman lied to McKinney to make himself seem like a big strong man. Either way, Mark Furman was a piece of shit. Maybe he's changed. God willing, I hope he has. But at that point in time, he was a piece of shit. 
And I hope that there is no longer an anti-women group in the LAPD or any other police force for that matter. And if this isn't all bad enough, it came out years before the trial. Furman sued the LA Pension Board asking to be relieved as a police officer while still receiving a pension. His reason for wanting to be relieved? Because his mind had been so poisoned by a hatred of Mexicans and African Americans caused by the job. Wait, I'm so sorry. So he's suggesting that the job caused him to be racist? He's suggesting that the suspects caused him to be racist. Oh, wowzer! Oh, wow. Okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, Marsha Clark's response when she first learned about the Furman tapes, and this is a direct quote, quote, what the fuck, dude? (laughs) And (laughs) Marsha agreed. 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 Yeah. Uh, I'm not denying that in 1994, Mark Furman wasn't a racist and sexist piece of shit. The question is, did he plant the second glove that was found on OJ's property hours after the murder? For one thing, Furman never had custody of any of the blood samples. So how did he supposedly plant a glove that had hair and fiber and blood from both Ron and Nicole? And how did Furman know that OJ had a pair just like it? And how did he know that OJ didn't have an alibi? For all Furman knew, OJ could have been inside the house all night with a bunch of people who could corroborate his whereabouts. Because if OJ had an alibi, it would be pointless to plant the gun or the gun, the glove. So it's just wild to me. There are just too many things. But then comes the point in the trial where the prosecution decides that maybe OJ should try the gloves on to prove that they fit. And look, I know I don't have any expertise in the world of law, but that is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. But Christopher Darden wanted OJ to try on the damn gloves. Marsha Clark begged him not to, but Darden was adamant. So it becomes a big production and OJ has to put on these thin latex gloves and then he tries to put the gloves on his hands and shockingly they don't fit. Photos of him holding the gloves up with this like expression on his face enrage me. And it's like the only thing I remembered from when this case, when I was like, the glove doesn't fit, you have to. Oh, it just like it, uh, it it bubbles up in my soul. Like it enrages. It's just, oh my God. Uh, One of the jurors later said that if OJ hadn't put the gloves on, he assumed it just would have fit. (laughs) Again, Darden, what were you thinking? If these aren't the same gloves that Nicole bought for OJ back in 1990. Then where are those gloves from 1990? But OJ's agent at the time, Mike Gilbert, claims uh, they knew that OJ would be asked to try on the gloves. So he recommended to OJ that he just not take his arthritis medication for a couple of weeks. So when it came time to trying on the gloves, OJ could barely bend his fingers to get the gloves on. Uh, And I will say this, when he holds them up to me, they look like they fit. (laughs) Like, I don't think it's, they're not, it's not like a man trying on a toddler glove. Like it's a very like, yeah, yeah, I I see it. And also also, they were bloody and then they dried. And then, you know. I also challenge anyone to put on a latex glove and then put on a second glove. Like when you have your hand already in a glove and then you're putting on another glove, like it's also going to feel awkward. Yep, yeah. Uh, So finally, we get to September 26th, 1995, time for final statements and closing arguments. Marsha Clark spoke for the prosecution and reminded the jury of the following. OJ's whereabouts were unknown from 9.36 until 10.53 p.m. OJ tried to call Paula Barbieri on his cell phone from the Bronco at 10.03 p.m. So we know he was driving around somewhere at 10.03. Cato Kalin heard three thumps on his wall around 10.52 p.m. Cato Kalin saw OJ wearing a dark sweatsuit at 9.36 p.m. 
Alan Park saw a person in dark clothing, six feet tall, 200 pounds, walk across the driveway and into the house at 10.54 p.m. Alan Park said he buzzed the intercom at 10.40, 10.43, and 10.49 and got no response any of those times. At 10.55, Alan Park buzzed the intercom and OJ answered. And I know I don't have time to fully get into this yet, but something about the trial that I need to just touch on briefly is just how badly Marcia Clark was treated. She was demonized by the press. They would post headlines like, Clark, good lawyer, bad mom, which is so incredibly unfair. Where was hate for any of the men involved in this case? The media shoved cameras in her face constantly, and it felt like the pressure was put solely on her. There was even one reporter in particular who shoved a microphone into Marsha's face after saying, quote, most of the public thinks you're a bitch. What do you say about that? I don't know why I had to make her so she was like the 30s. I don't know why. But the point is, what the fuck? Like, is how she somehow got worse treatment than OJ in the press during that time is wild to me. And I don't want to play the feminist card, or do I, uh, and say it's because she was the only woman. But when she had disagreements with her fellow prosecutors, they'd call her hysterical. Because men like to accuse women of being too emotional. Hashtag justice for Marsha. Yep. And Judge Ito would make comments to Marsha that I don't care for. An example would be them at the Rockingham House discussing whether or not the jury should tour or OJ's home. The judge uh, talked to Marsha about police manpower then looked at Marsha and went, I mean, person power. Okay, Ito. Uh, And some may argue he was trying to be inclusive, but Marsha said it was the tone that proved to her he wasn't. And speaking of Judge Lance Ito, if I may, just briefly, prior to the trial, his wife, Margaret York, was Mark Furman's superior officer. Which may not seem like a big deal, since he... Uh, But since he could be connected to one of the witnesses, maybe he should have recused himself? Yes. Maybe I'm wrong here, but it's not like Mark Furman's name wasn't on the list before the trial even started. I I just... I I forgot. If I knew that, I forgot about that. That's wild. uh, Johnny Cochran spoke for the defense and focused on the idea of a police cover-up the racial injustice that he believed that OJ had incurred. And at one point he compared Mark Furman to Hitler. Oh my word. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, that's, that's such a sticky thing to get into though. Cause I feel like that's so disrespectful to, to Mm. like, you know what I mean? Like, I know that people will say shit like that, like kind of, you know, conversationally, but it's like, but that's a really kind of, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, I'm not defending Mark Furman. I'm just nope. saying, let's be more respectful to the, the victims of Adolf Hitler is my point. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Johnny Cochran ended with the now famous line that turns my fucking stomach quote, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Must acquit. OJ never took the stand throughout the trial. Now it is said that a rough rule of thumb when it comes to jury deliberations is approximately one day of deliberation per week of trial. The trial lasted 267 days. So everyone thought the jury would take a lot of time. But after 1,105 pieces of evidence, 45,000 pages of court transcripts from 133 witnesses, the jury deliberated for three and a half hours. Wow. Yeah. Not even, not even half a day. Police were concerned about the public's reaction to the verdict. So they brought in extra officers, including some on horseback to patrol the crowds outside the courthouse. And on October 3rd, 1995, OJ Simpson was found not guilty which is wild. 
to me. Based on public surveys done one month after the murders, 63% of white people thought OJ was guilty. After the trial, that number jumped to 77%. In that same earlier poll, 65% of African Americans thought OJ was innocent. After the trial, that number jumped to 72%. But the jury had spoken and believed the prosecution had not proved beyond a reasonable doubt. So just a, a few brief things about the jury. According to author Jeffrey Tubin, nine members, which is three quarters of the jury, thought that OJ was less likely to have murdered his wife, quote, because he excelled at football. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. How many again? How many of them? Nine out of the 12. Nine out of the 12. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Five jurors thought it was acceptable to use force on a family member. Which makes me want to deeply question the jury selection process. But again, I don't have time. Yeah. When asked about OJ's blood being found at the crime scene, one juror suggested that maybe it had been left there prior to the murder, which is something that even the defense didn't even bother trying to argue because no, like all those perfect little blood droplets that weren't damaged by weather because they weren't left out in the elements. Right. For also, what was he doing bleeding at her house? So many things. Yeah. Uh, another juror felt that uh, it could have, the blood could have been one of OJ's children. Again, the blood came back as OJ's, not, not an OJ child, specifically OJ Simpson. Right. <sighs> the jury foreman later said, oh, she had no explanation for the incriminating evidence because... It just didn't factor into her decision. How a heaping pile of evidence doesn't factor into a decision in a murder trial is beyond me. One juror later admitted that 267 days of trial meant 266 nights being sequestered in a room alone, not being able to talk to their family or other jurors, she said the deliberation was quick because they'd all made up their minds. Another agreed, saying, quote, we had to go home. We'd been gone a year. We had to go home. Allegedly, when the verdict was read, one of the jurors did the Black Power salute like was seen at the 1968 Olympics. That juror was found to be a previous member of the Black Panthers, to which Marsha Clark said, how the fuck did we not know that in advance? And again, I want to say, Marsha, please walk me through how, how you selected the people on the jury, because you aren't you supposed to weed out biases and all that kind of thing in advance? I well, guess. but just like that guy hid that he kidnapped a girlfriend, right? Like it's. Yeah, I just feel like let us let us look at the jury. <laughs> Yeah. And I also want to make it clear. I'm not comparing being a member of the Black Panthers to kidnapping your girlfriend. I'm just suggesting that both would imply bias. I'm not saying that it is equally as bad or whatever. I mean, you no. know what I'm saying? It's like both it have hidden bias. things that yeah. could affect how they see the trial. Right. So one juror said that probably 90% of the jurors felt the verdict was payback for Rodney King, who was assaulted by LAPD officers in March 1991. Four officers were charged with assault an excessive force, but after a trial, all four men were acquitted. And I could rage about that verdict alone for hours yeah. because these assholes were caught on tape. There is video proof of their crime and to be acquitted is fucking gross. And I'll say it, shame on that jury in that moment. I'm specifically talking the Rodney King uh, yeah. jury at this point. But I, again, don't have time focusing on OJ. According to a survey by Nielsen and Sony, the verdict was the third most universally impactful moment on television in the last 50 years. 
Wow. The top six moments are as follows. And you'll see why I specifically am telling you the top six. Number one, the September 11th terrorist attacks in 2001. Number two, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Number three, the OJ verdict. Mm -hmm. Number four, Challenger space shuttle disaster in 1986. Mm -hmm. Number five, death of of Osama bin Laden in 2011. Number six, the white Bronco chase in 1994. Wow. OJ twice in the top six. I don't care for it. Since OJ had been in jail for 17 months at this point, shortly after his release, he went to see the movie Showgirls. For those who may be curious about other movie options he might have had at the time, those would include seven, Get Shorty, To Die For, Now and Then, Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, The Big Green, and To Wong Fu. I know what I would have picked. Wow. Same. Uh, I'm as shocked as you are that the serial womanizer chose showgirls. A week after the verdict, on October 11th, the second murder trial started for the Menendez brothers. So two massive trials back to back. But despite this lengthy trial, OJ wasn't done with a courtroom yet. The Goldman and Brown families sued OJ in civil court. We have talked about this on the show before about the difference between civil court and criminal court. Civil court, you need a much lower burden of proof than finding someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. All of the DNA experts from the trial returned and testified at the civil trial. The judge in this case, Judge Hiroshi Fujisaki, banned all allegations of a conspiracy from the police. Remember those size 12 Bruno Madgley bloody shoe prints that were found at the crime scene and in the Bronco? OJ, because he had to get on the stand in this one, and that made me happy, um, said he'd never wear those, quote, ugly ass shoes. But there are numerous photos of him wearing those very shoes, specifically while attending a Buffalo Bills game, September 26, 1993. The defense claimed the image was doctored to make their client look guilty. So an additional an, an additional 31 images of OJ in those shoes were submitted. Where are the shoes now? Oh, OJ doesn't know. He doesn't even recall owning them and says, oh, if he wore them, he must have just borrowed them from someone else. Okay. Yep. Yep. And while that is frustrating, it was nice to see OJ take the stand since he didn't at the criminal trial. Trial, However, he was fairly arrogant throughout most of it, laughing and doodling pictures of a golf course that he was designing while he was sitting there. At one point, he stood up mid-questioning, dropped his microphone and went, I got to take a leak. Super classy. Oh Super classy. God. I'm just so happy to see him take it seriously, you know? Uh, oh, and there's just the way that he said he doesn't remember ever hurting Nicole when there's photo proof of it is also enraging. It's way most things about this man are enraging to me. Oh, and remember Robert Kardashian? He claimed that during the trial, after the blood evidence came up, he thought, shit, I think he really did it. <laughs> so so he ended his friendship with OJ and testified on behalf of the Goldman family at the civil trial. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh the really positive thing about this trial is that TV cameras were not allowed in at all. Oh, and f- I I don't have it right in front of me, but from what I've read out of all of OJ's defense counsel, only one of them currently says he's innocent. <laughs> Really? The rest have all walked back and gone, well. Wow. So that says a lot. I read the book of the old man winter who, uh, I don't know why I call him that. He's just incredibly old. And it turns out not a great guy, but neither here nor there. Um, 
I just, I, it just happened that I read that book and it was like, oh my God. Yeah. He, he still, still thinks he's innocent. Okay. Uh, February 5th, 1997, OJ was found liable for willingly and wrongfully causing the deaths of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. He was ordered to pay $8 million in compensatory damages and a 12.5 million in punitive damages to both the Goldman family and to Nicole's estate. But just because he's ordered to pay doesn't mean that he will. He is protected under the homestead law in California, so that safeguards the house that he lives in. And since California is a right to work state, they can't garnish his wages what wages he earns. Uh, They also can't touch the multiple pension plans that he has, and he has some through the NFL. The court says he has to pay, but it's a creditor's job to actually make him pay. And I know you're like, but dude, he was in prison for like 17 months. So it's not like he was working and bringing in money. (laughs) Well, allegedly, while in prison, OJ was getting paid to sign autographs. He'd sign cards or numbers that would get taken out of the prison and then sewn onto a jersey or panels that would be taken out of the prison and sewn into making a football. He'd sit and sign like 2,500 cards at a time. OJ allegedly made about $3 million signing autographs during his time in jail. Wow. Get it. That's what he does. He's a has-been. All he's going to have are people who used to give a shit about him. So all he has is his signature. But what bothers me the most is that some of the things he signed were courtroom photos of himself. Sign the cards for the football teams that you played for, sure. But photos from your ex-wife's murder trial is fucking gross, man. Yeah. In February 1999, as part of this settlement, OJ had to sell his Heisman Trophy for $230,000. So very quickly, I would like to look at OJ's life after the trials. Um, In 1998, OJ did an interview with Ruby Wax from the BBC. He told her he had a surprise for her. Then he jumped out at her from behind a door, wielding a banana like it was a knife and pretending to stab her like a scene from the movie Psycho. It is the most ridiculous thing I have ever seen. Whether he was responsible for the murders or not, it was fucking tacky. In 2005, OJ released a straight-to-DVD prank show called Juiced, which was basically a punked knockoff. One such prank was OJ trying to sell his bullet hole ridden Bronco to people at a used car lot. Another was OJ dressed up in prosthetics, trying to sell oranges on the freeway. Oranges for OJ is is how he was putting it. The punchline of the show was, you've been juiced. Oh, oh my God. (laughs) What a fucking lame-o. Yeah. yeah, I said it. I guarantee he did not come up with that line. But at this point, I'm just like, fuck off, man. The second the second he put a hand on his wife, I was done. Even, yeah. even the cheating, I don't condone. But the second it's like, once you get physical, I, I don't do not condone uh, abuse of any kind. But no. Oh, oh, it got my it, it fired me up is what I'm saying. So I've been in this constant state of fire (laughs) for a while now. Uh, In September 2007, OJ led a group of men into a hotel in Las Vegas where they stole sports memorabilia at gunpoint. OJ insists it wasn't stealing, as he claimed he was just retrieving his own stolen property. Quickly, he claimed that his ex-agent had been pilfering stuff from him for years, like personal photo albums, Nicole's wedding ring, etc. And OJ just happened to be in Vegas for a wedding, so he got some friends together to intimidate the guys into giving him his stuff back. They arranged to meet the person selling the OJ memorabilia in a hotel room, and OJ shows up. Him and his friends have weapons. They take the items, even though it was nothing personal. It was literally just all OJ autographs that OJ had given this seller over the years. Even some of the autographs 
weren't his. Some of them were for other, I think there was like, I don't, I think like Joe Montana or something, but it was like, oh wow, whoever was selling it was like, whoever wants this much OJ stuff, maybe they'll want other people. So he brought other stuff to be like, look, I've got other players you might be interested in. And it's like, no, oh God. The point is they took everything, even if it, if it was OJ's signature or not. OJ was charged on 12 counts, including armed robbery and kidnapping, because when he got to the room, he said, nobody is leaving this room. Mm. And that is automatic kidnapping. During the trial, OJ said, quote, I didn't know I was doing anything illegal, which is my God. Yeah, which is wild since he took a group of armed men into a room, said no one is leaving this room until he gets his stuff. I think even a child would know that's wrong. But OK, yeah. the judge at the trial, Judge Jackie Glass, said, quote, earlier in this case at the bail hearing, I said to Mr. Simpson, I don't know if he was arrogant or ignorant or both. And during the trial and through this proceeding, I got the answer and it was both. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I like her. Uh, In 2008, he was found guilty on nine counts and sentenced to up to 33 years in prison. Some feel that number was chosen as a specific FU to OJ because he owed 33 million to Nicole and Ron's families in civil court. Oh, wow. But for good behavior, OJ walked out of Lovelock Correctional Institute in Nevada on October 1st, 2017. From what I can tell, OJ is currently living in Las Vegas. He is very active on Twitter. As of April 2020, he believes Carol Baskin's husband is, quote, Tiger Shishimi. It's nice to have his rock solid opinion on a famous true crime case. Oh, God. So the big question of the day is, if it wasn't OJ... Who could it have been? Private investigator William C. Deer believes the real killer was Jason, OJ's son from his first marriage. Jason was 24 at the time of the murders. After an 18 year investigation, Deer published his findings in the book, OJ is Innocent and I Can Prove It. And some of his theory makes sense, like how Jason was allegedly on probation for assault at the time of the murders. He had allegedly attacked his boss with a kitchen knife, and Jason had previously physically attacked his own girlfriend. Deere also claims that four different doctors reviewed Jason Simpson's records and determined that, quote, Jason Simpson is psychologically disturbed and in need of help. I don't know what all of Jason's they got to look at to make that that decision. Uh, Deere also claims that while attending the Army and Navy Academy, Jason was trained in hand-to-hand combat and field knife training. But what people don't know is that OJ might have also had some sort of knife training. In early 1994, OJ filmed a TV movie called Frogmen about a team of Navy SEALs who take on special assignments for the government. The movie was meant to be a pilot for a series set to air on NBC in the fall of 1994. After OJ's arrest, the series was canceled. It is believed that prior to filming, OJ and the cast received some level of combat training. How much training and to what degree? I don't know. Jason also uh, had no alibi for the night of the murders, and Deere is convinced that OJ went on trial to take the focus away from his son. And to me, if he did it to protect his son, why wouldn't he have just confessed and take the heat for his kid? But again, I just don't buy the theory because I don't see Jason's motive at all. But maybe that's just me. Uh, Another theory is that the LAPD covered up the murders for an L.A. drug dealer. Uh, (laughs) I got to tell you, just, it's just so much. (laughs) O.J. claims that people confessed to him that Nicole had gotten into drugs and she was out of control. I have not seen those people come forward to make those claims publicly. 
OJ went so far as to say he thinks Nicole was going to use the profits from her cocaine sales to buy a restaurant. So we're supposed to believe that Nicole just suddenly got into drugs and quickly upgraded herself to selling coke? That feels like a stretch to me. But I will admit that many people believe the restaurant Meza Luna was, quote, a nexus for drug trafficking in Brentwood. The thing is, it's the same restaurant that Nicole used to go to with OJ. So it's not like she started going there after they broke up and got into drugs while she was there. But when you start looking at the restaurant, you see things like Michael Nigg, a friend of Ron Goldman's. They met while both working at Mezzaluna. On September 8th, 1995, Michael was on his way to a restaurant when he stopped at an ATM. Two men approached him and demanded money. When Michael refused, they shot him in the head. His girlfriend, who witnessed the whole ordeal from the car, was unharmed. Three men, one believed to be the getaway driver, were arrested but were later released due to a lack of evidence. Michael worked at Mezzaluna until May 1994. I don't know why he specifically left when he did. Then on July 3rd, 1993, the body of Brett Cantor was found stabbed repeatedly in the upper body. Trigger warning, this is graphic. He sustained 23 stab wounds and his throat was cut so deep he was nearly decapitated which is similar to how Nicole was found. Brett was a record executive who is responsible for signing Jane's Addiction and Rage Against the Machine. Brett was part owner of a club called Dragonfly, which had once employed Ron Goldman. It is said that Nicole had visited there as well. And while the murders were similar, I have a hard time believing that it was committed by the same person. But I, I guess if we're if we're stretching it to try and find other people potentially involved, okay. As of February 2022, both Michael's and Brett's cases are still unsolved. Now, before I, before I leave you for today, of course, I have to mention the book. <laughs> I can barely barely get through it. OJ was offered money to sit down with a writer and give his thoughts of what he hypothetically think happened the night of Nicole's and Ron's murders. The book is called If I Did It. But when HarperCollins first announced it, there was a huge public outcry at the thought that OJ was potentially going to profit off of the murders. He was paid almost a million dollars for this. So in November 2006, HarperCollins owner Rupert Murdoch announced that the book would no longer be published, referring to it as, quote, an ill-considered project. Murdoch also fired the executive who was in charge of the deal. So the book got canned, but the rights to the book was up for grabs. And as OJ's largest debtor, the Goldman family was given the book's publishing rights and they had the book printed. The title is the same, but the word if is so small that when you look at the book, it just says, I did it. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Now, let me tell you, dear people, that book is a wild ride and horrifying at best. OJ did an interview with publisher Judith Regan in 2006 that was meant to air around the time of the book's release. However, when the book was pulled, so was the interview. Portions of the interview have since been aired, and hearing him say some of these things is definitely worse than reading what he had to say, uh, because it's just so carefree and it's, oh, I hate him so much. OJ talks about what he thinks hypothetically happened on the night of the murders. One thing I find unsettling is his account is always in the first person. For some reason, I thought he'd say, this is what the killer would do. Right. But it's always from the first person perspective, even when he's speaking in interviews. 
he always says, you know, I couldn't have done this alone. And then proceeds to tell the story about him and a fictional friend who the author calls Charlie. Uh, Basically, OJ says, hypothetically, he starts thinking about the recital and Charlie mentions Nicole and OJ gets angry. Quote, he wasn't the enemy. Nicole was the enemy. I looked at my watch. I had less than an hour before the limo showed up to take me to the airport. Just enough time to drive down to Bundy, read her the fucking riot act and get my ass back to the house. OJ says he might have parked in the alley and maybe grabbed the knit cap and gloves that he keeps in his car for cold mornings on the golf course. Quote, I reached under the seat for my knife. It was a very nice knife, a limited edition. I kept it on hand for the crazies. If you're looking for the crazies, <laughs> look in a mirror. The call is coming from inside <laughs> the house. A hundred percent. Uh, he steps through the broken security gate into ne- into the courtyard of Nicole's condo. It's specifically the fact that he's like, oh, yeah, that that latch is broken, which was a detail that nobody ever talked about before. That's interesting. Yep. Uh, this is a quote. Just as I was beginning to get seriously steamed, the back gate squeaked open. A guy came walking through like he owned the fucking place. He saw me and froze. OJ then hypothetically asks the guy who he is. The guy says he's there to drop off some glasses and then he's going home. OJ said, quote, you're a fucking liar. Takes one to know one. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if this isn't unsettling enough, OJ says, quote, I grabbed the knife. I do remember that portion. After that, I don't remember except I'm standing there and there's all kind of stuff around. The stuff in question being blood. The interviewer asks about removing the glove. OJ says, quote, you know, I have no conscious memory of doing it, but obviously I must have because they found the glove there. Which is the least hypothetical sounding statement. I was I've just going to say, is this you speculating about how you could have done it? Or is this you just saying this is your story? Right. It's it's wild. Uh, Charlie allegedly said, Quote, Jesus Christ, OJ, what have you done? And they return to the Bronco. Then OJ gives a very, very detailed description of the exact route that he hypothetically would have taken home. Here's your example. Quote, made a left onto Montana and an immediate right at the corner onto Gretna Green. San Vicente was a block away and I made a left there and took it all the way to Bristol then hung a right to sunset and made a left toward home. Which is so specific for a hypothetical. OJ said once he got home, he told Charlie he needed the bloody clothes and the knife to disappear forever. Again, a hypothetical, but the murder weapon has never been found. I will say that. All right. Uh, they thought it was found in 2016, but it was tested and found to not be the murder weapon. Uh, OJ said he went through a neighbor's property on a path that connects their properties near a tennis court. And he passed the guest house where Cato was staying, stumbled against one of the air conditioning units, made a loud noise, then went inside, didn't turn on any lights and quickly went and had a shower. Again, it's wild to hear him talk like this. And I, just it's so hard to take it as a hypothetical um but i want to end this bit with more wild things that oj has said in interviews they irk me so what irks me irks us all quote i don't know what the hell you want from me i'm not going to tell you i sliced my ex-wife's neck and watched her eyes roll into her head wow quote Ron and Nicole were physically dead, and it's almost like they killed me. Who I was was attacked and murdered also. What a victim. Yep. Nicole's family said they received calls from the cemetery where Nicole was buried, saying OJ was at her grave screaming. He was causing such a scene, they decided to call the family about it. And allegedly, that happened more than once, to the point where... They would call, the family would answer, and they'd go, he's back. 
And OJ admitted to doing it, saying, yes, he would go to Nicole's grave and curse her for leaving their children without a mother, as though it was her fault. But the abuser always likes to put blame on the victim. Uh, When asked about attending Nicole's wake, OJ said, quote, when you're angry at someone in their death, when they die, it's not like the anger disappears. Because of that 911 call where I'm yelling at her about what's going on, it's almost like I wanted to say, I told you, didn't I tell you? He then follows this with, quote, I've never been able to say this. I'm never going to be able to change this person's mind again. I'm never going to be able to affect this person again. Wow. Just unpack that real quick. Uh, His first thought at the wake of the woman he supposedly loved more than anything was anger. He wouldn't be able to have an effect on her ever again. And you told her what? You once told her you were going to kill her. So you're going to need to be more specific about this. I told you. Uh, And his anger over the 911 call from October that occurred seven months before the fact that he holds on to so much anger towards Nicole is hard to ignore. But in a criminal court of law, he was found not guilty. And after OJ was acquitted, it seems as though the case of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman was never looked into again. It's sad to think that the lives of two people could end so brutally without any justice in sight. To quote OJ, quote, that pisses me off the most. Someone is walking around free. And for once, I agree with OJ Simpson. (laughs) Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm Christy Oxborough. Oh, wow. <laughs> there is just so much I want to comment on. So we got to take yeah. a second break so quick, yeah. grab another drink, hit the can, and we're going to be right back with some thoughts about Mr. Simpson on the yeah. Nicole Brown Simpson episode of True Crime and Cocktails. All right, last clap. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, talking about Nicole Brown Simpson. I have so many thoughts. I'm going to try and just dive right in. Um, you know, it's funny. I You brought up early on uh, statistics about uh, intimate partner uh, violence and being, you know, statistically, it's very high in terms of yeah. women who've died or family member. I can't remember where I was. You'll love this. I can't remember where I was or who I was talking to, but this still is relevant. Uh, something was being brought up and I said something about someone being killed, a woman being killed. And I said the murderer and I, I, I pronounced it, which I, I would, I would rescind based on, um, if it was about like, oh, I should be more inclusive about pronouns. But the person who I was speaking to was a man who got offended and was like, why are you putting it on a man? And that's when I was like, because statistically speaking, if the woman was killed, it was probably, and then it like, as time went on and whatever we were talking about, it turned out that it was the, the woman's husband that had killed her. And I was just like, um, again, I am happy to change how I refer to pronouns to be inclusive, but in, but that was not his problem was my point. He felt that he was being attacked as a man and I can't, um, Bo Jackson pro stars loved that show. <laughs> I knew I brought him up for a reason. Oh yeah, these notes are chaotic, but they'll go somewhere good. Shout out Michael Landon, two weeks in a row. My heart feels full. Um, First thing, and again, I'm not going to dwell on this now because I'm going to talk about it at the very end when I talk about my final theory. His eyes glaze over. That was a detail that I thought was very important when he's having one of these things. His eyes glaze over. Um, also the fact that the, this, I believe it was the second, um, it was 1978 when she had to go to the hospital and they faked that it was a bicycle accident and it was like possible skull fracture again, like just the level that we're getting to here, um, is so extreme, so extreme that poor woman, my God, um, uh, yep. Sorry. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going through no, everything no. I starred here. It's also so interesting to me too, like the, the whole setting, the scene, 
you know, making him the hero. Well, I was so tired and I was so whatever. And I flew in for this dance recital anyway. It's like, well, you, I mean, yeah, that's great. Like to me, it's like, well, you kind of did what you kind of should have as a parent. It feels like if, especially if you'd already missed something prior and I'm prefacing this by saying he was also a person of privilege in terms of money. So he had a job or a financial situation where he could do that. I'm not saying that every parent has the ability to be at every child's event, every event, but he was definitely someone who had the means to be there. So again, like trying to make it sound like he was such a hero. Again, this is all just adding to like (laughs) psychology hat diagnosis here. Um, But again, there's so many instances of him lying. It's wild. Him telling, changing stories and you know, did he get asked to go to the dinner or did he, did he ask and get turned down and all those little things. It's, there's so many instances throughout all of this about him lying that it's just like, it's all, it's so tragic because it feels like we may never know exactly what truly happened. But like I said, partway through, it's like, it's terrible. Every, from every angle, this is awful. Like for everyone involved in terms of the victims, my God, and their families awful. Now, he goes to Chicago. He's in the hotel. The Chicago hotel has corroborated that there was a blo- broken glass in that room. OJ, I don't think is stupid. And I think that it's possible that if he already had a cut on his hand, that he would just break the glass, put his blood on it, leave it in the hotel room so that he has that covered. Like that to me is yeah. like, to me, there, that doesn't mean anything that the hotel corroborated that because again, with the timeline and to your point, the fact that there was already blood on the Bronco would prove that there had that blood had to come from somewhere out of him. Right. Yep. And if it wasn't disintegrated, then it feels like, again, it just, that's a very easy way to try and cover and make it look like, and again, not a dumb move like that's yeah, I get it, but not smart enough. Um, I just wrote down good job on the Kardashian coverage, all accurate. <laughs> Thank you. I also, did have to Google because I, I know they exist, but I did, um, I didn't, I didn't realize it, it never really dawned on me why two of them are Jenner and the rest are Kardashian. So that was a whole thing. And to be honest, and I think I speak for all of us, I forgot about Rob. <laughs> well, listen, you know, he's wanted to be out of the public eye. I mean, I respect that. Um, and yes, but I, I get that he's not top of mind. Uh, but I will also say I'm always available to consult on all things Kardashian. Um, Perfect. and I love them and I don't feel bad about it. They're very kind people from, from everything I've experienced. Uh, but anyway, uh, and again, I shout out to Chris Jenner, who, again, I, you made a career and an empire out of nothing. Oh out yeah. Of, out of a name. And I, God bless you. Um, any woman who's, who, you know, successful, I, I support, uh, loved your, loved your message to Lamar Odom. I always <laughs> rooted for Chloe and Lamar. I really did. And now it is like Lamar take a nap. Um, because it did, at some point it does start to feel creepy. Like the, the last one that came out, I did have my gut go a little bit, to be honest with you. I was like, Ooh, I, I, I am a little bit, I'm concerned for Chloe. Like I was like, let's, let's, is somebody noting this? Like, I'm like, I don't know. Like I, it's starting to cross over for me a little bit into like, I hope she's okay. Do you know what I mean? It has gone gone through so much. It's like, leave her alone. It has gone beyond. It's not over for me. It's never over. And has gone into like, I didn't stalk her. I just happened to go to her house uninvited, you know? Yeah. All jokes aside, I, I really do wish her the best. Cause that it, it does yes. feel a little bit troubling. Um, shout out Sterling K Brown, who played Christopher Darden in the people versus OJ, which is one of my favorite television moments of all time. Um, I'll get into the story about me and Sterling K Brown later. He's a peach, just the oh, nicest, nice. nicest human. And I was gushing anyway. I mean, effusive. I don't mean below the belt. Why did I say that? Why? <laughs> Nobody went there but me. Nobody (laughs) thought it but me. I'm going to get back to my notes. Oh, this is embarrassing. Okay. It didn't even cross Blanche's mind. I I love that so much. I know. Oh my God. It's your Blanche. Well, that's. We'll talk about this later. Okay. (laughs) So now we're going to get into more of the serious stuff. So this whole thing, and I forgot about this. 
Marsha Clark getting the idea to take them to the crime scene and it's a total, it backfires completely. And I, I remembered some of those details as you were going through that. My question is how often do lawyers do that in cases? Because to me, it does feel like there's a lot of room for error. And I understand that it's like you're trying to get them out of the courtroom and whatnot. Yeah. But I don't know that it's more impactful than seeing crime scene photos. Personally, I feel like crime scene photos are pretty impactful and horrific most of the time. I mean, we've learned that from stumbling upon things we never wanted to see in researching this show. Yeah. Um, I also have to say, again, the thing that made my, and there's so much that made my stomach turn, but OJ saying the abuse was in her head. I, mm. I don't, it, uh, gaslighting her after death. We also know for a fact there is 911 call evidence. There is police officers that witnessed her and him. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't in her head. And I'm not saying that allegedly. I'll just say it like, fuck off. That's, I, 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 my back goes up when it's also like, she's also not here anymore. She was brutally murdered. And to say like, own it, just own it. Own it that it was like, you know what? However he wants to put it through his own bullshit lens. Own yeah. it, you know, say what, and I'm not going to put words cause I don't want to, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, that just made, makes my blood boil. Um, because again, it's a lie. And we all know there's there's physical there's evidence. There's proof. There's recordings. There's there's other eyewitnesses. Yeah, I can't. Um, but again, it's all painting a picture. Um, now, I never thought I would say this because again, there's nothing I fear more and anyone who listens to the show knows than crooked cops. And I want to make it very clear. I'm not saying that there weren't crooked cops involved in this case. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But it does feel like when the defense, when it, when everything is approached as could have been planted by the police, it's like, but then if we're starting to adopt that mentality, you could literally say that about every piece of evidence gathered at every crime scene for every crime, right? Like, where does, where does that begin and where does that end? Like, and I don't know, I'm not saying, I have no idea what the truth is there and we will never know very sadly, but it's just tough for me when it's like, are there like, what are the checks and balances then? Because if you literally, because then it does feel like it's gaslighting too, where it's like, well, we found this blood in the car, could have been planted later. It's like, again, well, we could say that about any, any evidence in any case. I mean, it is also, I know, very tough to prove traditionally a murder if there is no body, now that we're in this case, um, but also no murder weapon. I know that that's a, that's a tough burden for prosecution, but again, just, just, everything, every, it just feels again, like so frustrating when it's like every piece of defense is what well, could have been the, could have been crooked cops. Cause yeah, that's true all the time. But again, where do we, where do we go then? We don't, we don't, we don't charge. We don't try any crimes because they all could have been contaminated. I also just want to know, like, what would Mark Furman's motive have been to plant that glove? Just that it's like, oh, it's OJ. And I want to see that successful black man go down. Absolutely, that could be a motive. Sure, that could that could be enough of a motive. I'm not saying it's not, but the timeline for me is tough. That he would have had the time in the moment they found these two bodies that are brutally murdered, and for him in that moment to go, it's probably OJ. I'm going to pick up this glove. I'm going to take it to OJ's house and plant it. I don't know statistics, but I do think that typically evidence being planted is not happening in the 20 minutes after the crime. Do you know what I mean? Like in the, in the short, like, I feel yeah. like that's something that kind of happens a little bit later or, and listen, is it possible he just picked it up, pocketed it and then lied and said that he found it there when it was actually in his pocket the whole time? Sure it is. So again, I'm not saying one way or the other. I just put it out there that it just feels again, like, I don't know. I mean, again, if he's enough of a racist, yeah, that is enough of a motive. And he did, you know, highly, uh, damage all of his credibility because he was a piece of shit. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's just so hard to know. Uh, the thing with the shoes is crazy. The fact that he was like, I've never worn them. And then it's like, here's 32 photographs. Here's 32 photographs. Yep. But again, he lies and lies and lies and lies. So I just don't think we can trust anything that he says. He's been caught in so many lies. He said so many conflicting stories. I don't think yep. that we can believe him about anything. Um, shout out to Marsha Clark and Sarah Paulson, because God, she is a gift to the craft. 
<laughs> she just is. She's so talented. <laughs> that was First very earnest. One, agree. Two, could not be more delighted <laughs> that 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 you used the word the craft. I, Specifically, I, the craft is what did it for me. Oh, jagged little pill. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's not stopping. Um, the arthritis medication blew my mind, but it doesn't surprise me. Um, oh yeah, and Marsha's hair. I remember that was such a thing too, right? She got that haircut at one point. She was trying to like change her appearance a little bit, and then they just just ripped her apart and it's like you i i, I just again hashtag justice for marcia clark because i feel oh, like she really yeah. got the she really got abused during that time um i for either didn't know or i forgot about lancy doe's wife and that does feel like a huge issue that does feel like he should have absolutely recused himself based on the little bit that i know um in terms of how this stuff works because it does feel a little too close uh now, here we go. Is it possible? Because you're talking about his son, Jason. And I'm yes. like, what's his motive? Why? Why is he going to Nicole's house that night? Why is he killing her? Why is he killing Ron? Like, he, he doesn't seemingly have a motive. And you know what's wild is I said, is it possible that, he, that they worked together? And then so it's so wild that in OJ's book account, he talks about doing it with somebody else. Or that there yeah. was somebody else there. I don't know. Again, it's 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 really interesting because it just doesn't feel like he would have a motive to do it on his own. Um, and I also think it's interesting if he did struggle with mental health issues because not all, but some are known to be genetic. And it definitely feels like I'm speculating, I'm alleging, but it's definitely feeling like OJ was struggling with something because that level of rage and the specifics, the lying, um, the never being responsible for anything, the fact that he hurt her so badly and then said, oh, it was even, like we both hurt each other evenly. Ugh. Like it's like, that is all really, again, the eyes glazing over all of these kinds of things. It just feels again to me like, there's something else going on. Like, why is he so angry screaming at her grave? I mean, these are specifics yeah. where I'm like, this man, I feel like needs help, like, or, or de desperately needed some sort of medical attention, like, um, yeah, psychiatric help. Uh, and so I did do just a quick on the break. I was like, I felt like at first, maybe this is like a dissociative disorder because there can be times where, and I'm going to very quickly and, and not properly so don't come for me again, but this is just the, the basics. There are times, especially in childhood, if you endure some sort of trauma that your psyche can kind of split for some people, it can be as extreme as creating another personality. So that falls under the dissociative kind of umbrella, but there is dissociative disorders where you can kind of go into this other reality almost. And so some of the things I heard throughout this to me, I was like, it sounds like that could be true for him again. Like the the, the eyes glazing over the blind rage, the never taking responsibility, the saying that he doesn't have a memory of it. And so I just did another quick, uh, quick search. And there is another, um, there's something called blind rage syndrome. Have you read about this? No. And that it was a new, I think it was like in the eighties, it was a new potential diagnostic category for the DSM. Um, and it was basically, which is the, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And so it's very quickly, it's characterized by violent overreaction to physical, verbal, or visual insult, or what the person perceives to be insult. Mm -hmm. Amnesia during the actual period of violence. Oh. Abnormally great strength. Specifically target-oriented violence. Oh. So specifically targeting somebody specifically. And he, it seemed even post-death when he was like, I just can't believe I'm not going to be able to affect this person anymore. He had a target and it was Nicole and that was it. And then it does go on to say that this could fall under the dissociative umbrella, which is interesting to me because that was my initial kind of instinct. So I offer that only as a possibility. It doesn't explain who did it, why, you know, but, but again, 
at the end of the day, he has the motive. There's blood evidence. Um, even if there was stuff that was planted, there's still a lot. And look, at the end of the day, you could also argue that the prosecution did not did not do it. They didn't. You could you could argue that they didn't provide enough evidence or or argue a case well enough to give beyond the shadow of a doubt. I think also, again, the fact that the case was 267 days long, like those jurors were saying, they were tired, they wanted out of there. I mean, you can't, you're not supposed to be talking to your family or anybody for that amount of time. That can ruin people's lives. I'm sure that that could make people just go like, I just get me out, just let me go. Like, and I don't know what the average amount of time on a murder trial is, to be honest, but I feel like the better part of a year feels rough. I'm not um, defending that choice of, just giving a verdict to get out of there. I'm not defending that at all. I'm just saying that human nature, I could see that being a factor. So again, at the end of the day, I question, is it possible his son was involved? I definitely ask about mental health here. I, and, and that, again, that doesn't um, exonerate anybody of any of those potential actions, but it just feels like he had a real obsession, the stalking, the violence. And it, it is it possible it was somebody else? I guess, but again, when you have that long of a list, it's very difficult to believe um, Yeah, that there's someone else who would have as compelling a motive, especially when we knew about his jealousy issues and then oh. seeing Ron, unfortunately, coming at the same time. Oh, yeah. That, he was absolutely a case of the wrong place, the wrong time. And I can't help but wonder what, level of guilt did Nicole's mother feel because Ron would not have been there. I am not totally. suggesting it was her fault no. either way, but it's just, I know how I would have reacted to that. And I, I just can't even begin to imagine. Um, it's, it's so hard. I remembered this whole thing um, very vaguely because I mean, I was like 13, 14 at the time. And so I didn't care. And plus I was still, I was still in mourning (laughs) from Kurt Cobain that I I was not, I was not in any place emotionally to, to care about people I'd never heard of Uh, like celebrities. I was supposed to care about that. I was like, I've never heard of these people. Um, And so I, I remember the Bronco chase. I remember seeing the gloves and then it was like, he's not guilty. And I was like, okay. And I had always assumed he, that it was like, oh, so he was being charged with killing his wife and her, her lover. And it's like, well, she was his ex-wife at the time. And that was not her lover. And even if it was, she was, she was welcome to take one at any point she wanted because she was a single woman. Um, She was also so stunning, which is, and (sighs) It's just so frustrating for her because once once she wants to go out and on the prowl, you can't tell me she wouldn't have had so much attention and then he would have killed off so many attempts and uh, who knows if some if another man would have been willing to put up with him for that long because he never would have let her go. Uh, I tried so hard to come at this from like a okay. Let's who knows who the killer could be kind of thing. But every corner we turn, it's like, here's more. And it's just hard for me to ignore. I want to be angry at the prosecution. But again, I mean, so many days for that trial, 1100 pieces of evidence, over 100 witnesses, like it's so boring. I get the whole idea of, oh, my God, just get us out of here. But I'm, I just find it wild that they're, that they were all so like, oh yeah, we don't think he did it. And I will never, never understand how divorce or not divorce. Well, that was weird. Uh, defense attorneys in a murder trial, when they're like, we think he did it, how they sleep at night being like, well, I did my job. Well, I mean, again, you client know? lawyer privilege, like some lawyers, defense lawyers know the truth. So there's defense lawyers that know that their client committed the murder and that they, it's their job to 
try and get them off in whatever way they see fit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, try and poke holes. The other big thing that's interesting too was, and I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but like, I feel like another thing that I hear all the time is like defense, defense teams are like burdened with trying to not only prove that the person didn't do it, but kind of, kind of trying to present other possible suspects. But I feel like right. in this case, they kind of didn't. Did they in the trial? No. Like, I feel like it, was, it wasn't until later that this other stuff kind of came out. Oh, yeah, it was. It was it's, it's either him or we don't even discuss it. Like it was we're not even going to look at possibilities, which usually that is a great thing for defense to bring up because it's like, hey, look at all these people who could have done it. But they were just I mean, again, DNA evidence was so new. And so they just tried their best to hide it. And we're like, look at these racist pieces of shit trying to take down this poor, innocent man. And it's like, I ah. Um, I will say quickly something I forgot to bring up. The defense, um, one of their big things was like, okay, so let's say OJ drove from his house to her house, committed these crimes, came back to his house, How would he have had time in the five, six minutes from when he was supposedly seen outside the house until he came out? Because it was like from the time he buzzed and and actually responded to the limo driver, he was only about five or six minutes until he came out. So they're like, how would he have, you know, disposed of the clothes, disposed of the knife, cleaned up, packed all of this? To that, I say he packed prior to that right because he was at home for like 30 minutes or so prior to leaving where he said he packed when he got home uh secondly um airplane and airport security in 1994 was pretty lax so if he grabbed all the clothes and even the knife and shoved them in a bag and got into the limo he could have disposed of that bag at the airport he could have taken the knife out and thrown it in the garbage he could have taken it on the plane and they might not have even noticed and thrown it out somewhere when he got to chicago um but they were like oh it's just it's not possible i want to point out from 360 north rockingham avenue which is where oj lived to 875 south bundy drive where nicole lived is two miles or 3.2 kilometers. He could have easily, easily done that. And so I just find it bullshit that they were like, oh, that's not enough time. It's like he came in the house. He had a shower. He was, it takes so little to shower. He came out, the limo driver even said when he got in the limo, he had sweat on his forehead. He asked about like, putting windows down or putting on air conditioning. And so it's like, so he was in a big hurry. You can do a lot in five minutes if you're motivated. And so I just, I cannot see anyone who has a motive more than he does. Well, and because we also know that he's shown up to her house before. Oh yeah. We also know that he was angry or he was frustrated that night to begin with because he was chipping the golf golf balls or whatever he talked about like being like right Mm -hmm. he was trying to reach his girlfriend paula and she wasn't answering him like it's like he was it feels like he was he was working himself up like it was like he was trying to to de-escalate and inadvertently was kind of working himself up is what it's it feels like to me yeah i'm speculating um but yeah again it's like like there's just no and then again okay if we want to go down the drug drug dealer route okay i i mean um is it possible there was a drug ring operating out of that place in Brentwood? Yes. I mean, anything's possible, but like, I will also just offer living here. Like Brentwood is like exceptionally wealthy. And that's not to say that doesn't mean a drug ring couldn't exist there, but I mean, for there to be pulling off hits, it's like, well, so then why, what, what's the motive there? So is the motive that they followed Ron because the way that it seemed that the the autopsy or what the autopsies showed from what from what you communicated was yeah the killer was killing nicole ron kind of came upon it it seemed yeah and tried to stop him the killer 
dealt with Ron, went back to Nicole, went back to Ron, right? Yeah. So it feels like the killer was there to kill Nicole. And then Ron, again, wrong place, wrong time, trying t- trying to help and very sad. I mean, truly. Oh. Um, but again, I'm like, so what would her beef be with these drug dealers? If what, okay. So, okay, let's like, she didn't have enough time, it feels like, to be getting in so deep that she like owed them a ton of money or like, you know what I mean? And I guess anything is possible, but it just feels like a bit of a leap when she has a husband or excuse me, an ex-husband at the time who has a history of showing up there unannounced at night, who has a history of anger and violence and being volatile specifically towards her. I mean, again, it's it's still, it's 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 fascinating. It's fascinating how that, court case it feels like just got so bungled it got so oh, yeah the media and the attention and the glove and and going to the crime scene it feels like all of that stuff it just it just bungled it it feels like that that's um and and it again who's to say who's to say either way other than again it also just feels interesting to me that this book where it's like if i did it i thought that would be here's how I physically did it. So the detail, which is also wild that he knew that the security gate was the one of them was broken and that no one else had brought that up. It's like, well, but what fascinates me is that it got into like his mindset at the time that he's talking about, like I was worked up after the recital and I was, you know, whatever. It's like, hold on a second. So not only are you telling us how you would have, you quote unquote, would have physically done it, but now you're telling us what your motive would have been in your state of mind at the time. Like, I don't know. I mean, again, no matter how you slice it, it is so tragic. And again, those poor young lives, like what is it? 37, sorry, 35 and 28 or 35 and 25, 35 and 25. My God, like that's just so sad. And again, you know, at the end of the day too, I think it's important to just note also that like domestic violence and, and intimate partner violence, it's, it's, it's such a, it's such a prevalent um, issue. And this is, it would be, uh, we would be remiss if, if not to just say again, like, it's like, you know, those kinds of things are so nuanced and she was trying so hard to get out. And I think that that's also like, what makes it even more tragic because it must have been so hard, obviously from her diary entries and everything we know about her, she was really trying and it's so hard. Those situations are extremely difficult and it's extremely difficult to, to remove yourself, especially when there's children and all of the above and she did it and then, and then died so shortly afterwards. It's just, again, such a tragedy. Um, and also just so wild that it's, it's, it's kind of interlaced with such a public, um, figure who also, you know, made so many massive verbal statements. Again, Mm. the the Bronco chase, all of that, like it was all wild, wildly over the top (laughs) on his part. Uh, But listen, fabulous research. I really think that you did an exceptional job distilling down what is one of the most detailed uh, cases I feel like we've ever covered into less than three hours. So kudos. (laughs) It, uh, I couldn't have done it. I w- we would have been on hour seven by now. It's it's been well. It's been yeah. I I can't ever look or hear about that trial again. Yeah, I think. Uh, but it was it, it. Once you start getting into it, it's like there's so much, and then you're like, oh shit, I could probably leave this off, and then you're like, oh, I need all of this for background, and then it's just before you know it just again and so the idea of like how much i brought up the idea that the jury sat through that for 267 days i would have just been like i need i i need out i get so it so i get it but also uh i i think if he had chosen to stay in new york that nicole would have survived that weekend I'm not saying he wouldn't have gone for her after that. I'm just saying, I just find it so hard to believe. Well, yeah. And I think it's important to note too, like, and I'm not suggesting that everything's a walk in the park for women now by any stretch of the imagination, but like, 
also keep in mind again the way that Marsha Clark was treated throughout all of this. <sighs> The fact that Mark Furman was a group was a part of a group men against women, specifically targeting women within the LAPD that was had over 100 members, you know, just again, as a reminder, potentially for our younger listeners, you know, it was a it was a time where also it just feels again, like the fact that, that, that so many people in the jury said that we didn't think he could commit a murder because he was good at football. And I know oh. that that sounds insane, but I think it's important to remember that, that the perception of celebrity and um, status and what all of that kind of world looks like to people, you know, it, you'll hear that all the time. I mean, I've heard people say like, well, I don't believe that Johnny Depp abused Amber Heard, because he's such a, you know, he seems like such a great actor and such a good guy. And I'm not saying one way or the other, we're not getting into that. We don't have the time. But the point (laughs) is, is that it's like, I think it's important to remember that, that, you know, intimate partner violence, domestic violence can affect absolutely anybody. It does not discriminate. It is not based on anything. There is no kind of like status or means or, or any sort of of uh, deciding factor that means that you would be unaffected. It can it can affect again people in every walk of life, every city, every town, everywhere in the world. And I think that again, it's important to remind, just to point that out again. That I think that even now people maybe don't don't necessarily think about things in those terms. But I think certainly in the early '90s there was even less of that kind of awareness uh, in general. Um, so I think it's important to note that as well because again. Oh, justice for all these people. It's uh, especially uh, the women. Um, Christy Oxborough, thank you so much for your work. It's uh, It was a riveting episode. I was on the edge of my seat. And again, this is a case I know a lot about. So uh, kudos to you. As always, you are too kind. It's what I do. Um, uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the show. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the social meds, uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, at True Crime and Cocktails, Twitter, at Not Detectives, Patreon, patreon.com slash true crime and cocktails. And the only place to get official true crime and cocktails merch is truecrewmerch.com. Whole lot of fun stuff over there. So check that out for sure. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? Oh, on the next true crime and cocktails, Ed and Lorraine Warren. And for those who don't know, this is, of course, a paranormal episode of the show, which we've been getting many requests for. So buckle in for that because things are going to get spooky. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night. I I was going to say Keanu Reeves and then I was like, you hush your (laughs) Because then I felt I was upsetting Dave Grohl. Dave Grohl doesn't listen to this. You know what? (laughs) Good night, Keanu Reeves. And Dave Grohl. Good night, Sterling K. Brown. He's so nice.